bullshit. Supposed to be shocked about impact now. I'd like to get through the show in five minutes. It was a lousy impact. I didn't get angry at anything. I just thought, wow, that's stupid. Over and over and over and over again. Actually, I gotta say, this was the worst promoted pay per view go home show it's, in the history of the world. And yes. Let me tell everybody a fact. As everybody knows, impact is followed by a reaction. At eleven o'clock PM. At the end of the two-hour impact block, there was no main event for the pay-per-view that is this Sunday. Yes. So, not that people buy pay-per-views in Australia or England, but if this is one of those weeks where the show goes off the air at 11, and they don't edit the show to fit in two hours, which they've done several times now, and we've gotten emails from Australia and England from people upset that they didn't get to see the end of the show because TNA didn't edit it, those people will have no idea what the main event is for the pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. They will have absolutely no idea. So what they did this week was they announced what the main event of the pay-per-view was on Reaction. Now, granted, Reaction got a very big first quarter last week for the uh, Matt Morgan-Jeff Garrett chain match. But usually that show does like a point seven. That's the show they decided that they were going to reveal the main event of the pay-per-view on. Can you imagine that? That's like on Raw. No. <laughs> that's like on Raw if they did not announce the main event for Survivor Series on the last Raw and decided they were going to announce it on NXT, NXT yes. if it were still on sci fi. Can you even imagine? No. So, anyway. And, and, and as noted, it's the go home show. Yeah. It, it, it would be one thing, it was so stupid. But if they did it three weeks before the show, that would be much less dumb. We said this many times, but I mean, this is, this is really the God's honest. Nobody is buying this show. I mean, if if this does more than 8,000 buys, really, I'll I'll be like, I won't even know what to say. I will be confounded, (laughs) as you said the other day. In fact, as we we discussed how horrible the bill for the main event is, name me three other matches in the show. I can't. I can do two. What are the other two? Pope versus Abyss in the Fans are Lumberjacks match. That's right. And Tommy Dreamer versus Rob Van Dam. That's right. Other than that, I have absolutely no idea what's on the show. Yeah. Let me actually go. You start. Oh, 3D. You, that's right. You start, and I'm going to go to uh, Wikipedia, and we'll find out if, if those people have any idea what the card is. Eric Bischoff came out. He had Ric Flair with him. He had his karate gear on. He announced that Matt Morgan had been kicked out of Fortune and Immortal. That meant, apparently, he was fired from TNA. He wished him the best of luck in his future endeavors, using those exact words. He then... I don't know what happened. I guess he beat up the ref, I guess because the referee unlocked Matt Morgan from the chain first last week or something. He beat him up, some out of the ring, and also fired him. That was that. Oh, he also announced, I didn't write this down, he announced that the main event of this show would be himself versus Ken Anderson, and if Anderson could beat him, he would get a title shot at the pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. With the gimmick, of course, being that everyone knew Anderson was not there. There are actually eight matches on Wikipedia for this show. I'll be damned. Jeff Hardy gets Matt Morgan. For the title. Machine Guns versus 3D for the title in Team 3D's retirement match. And Wikipedia did not even bother billing it as a retirement match. Jay Lethal versus Robbie uh, yeah, E. Yeah. For the TNX title. ED2 versus Fortune. With the winning team firing a member of the losing team. Which apparently Sabu has gotten word out it's going to be him. And he's pissed. <laughs> Fantastic. Ah. Can you hear the story? No. Yeah, apparently they, they, they uh, Terry Taylor called him like this week and said, we're firing you at the pay-per-view. Creative can't think of anything to do with you. So Sabu, I mean, he could have just no-showed, but mm-hmm. he's going to show up to be a professional, but he's pissed well, off. He's not that professional because he's going to bitch about it publicly. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know if he bitched about it, but but uh, people that he, he knows apparently bitched about yeah, he it. He is being fired at uh, just not a... As far as bitching goes, that's bitch-worthy. Yeah. He's being fired. I would bitch too. Nikki James and Tara. You're skipping like eight things. No, I'm I'm oh, you that line up, you jackass. Uh, yeah. Samoa Joe and Jeff Jarrett. Tommy Dreamer and Rob Van Dam. And Abyss and D'Angelo De Niro in a lumberjack match. And boy are we gonna get to that in a minute here. Alright, go on. Alright, next segment. 
EB2 was hanging out in the locker room. For some reason, Spanky was getting a massage and also reading from Mick Foley's book. We think. They actually didn't an- announce what book it was, but we were supposed to know by... Just because we're supposed to know. Yeah. Uh, RVD walked in. He was pissed. They all bitched at each other. Fortune walked in. He said that somebody from EB2 was leaving, so I guess that was how we were supposed to know what the steps of that match were. He was in Rhino's face. Actually, sure. actually, what he said, his exact words... He did not say that someone was going to be fired or someone was going to be retired. He simply said that after the pay-per-view, somebody was going home. Hmm. In other words, they could be back a month later. Sure. <laughs> this is going to get a plane ticket, and they are going to go home, and that would be that. Mm-hmm. After what happens after that, we don't know. So, yes, uh, he got in everyone's face. He, okay, <sighs> Rhino was sitting down. Yeah. AJ was yelling in his face, being a dick. So Rhino decided, I am going to gore this fucker. Rhino leapt out of his, from his stool. AJ stepped out of the way. Rhino could not stop his momentum and speared Rob Van Dam into the lockers. Yeah. I use the term honky. This looked honky. Maybe there's a better word. There must be, because that's the technically a racial slur for white people. That's not the Which honky that I was using. It just looked honky. It did not look believable. No. Hokey? Is that what we're looking for? Wonky? Wonky, that's best. Hokey. It was wonky and hokey. It was honky. It was certainly not good. We had a Ken Anderson uh, phone interview. Actually, this was really awesome, frankly. He was almost entirely out of character, just talking about how messed up he was. They showed a replay of the chair shot, and it was actually even much worse than I thought. I thought the chair, like, hit him in the back and then slid up and caught his head. No, the chair hit his head first. Yeah. That sucks. But it was all very low-key, taken very seriously. He was messed up. He said he was going to the Mayo Clinic for a checkup. He didn't know when he would be back. They wished him the best. This was actually really good. They had giant thumbs up for this part. Yeah. Giant thumbs down for bullshit with Winter. You will never guess where the beautiful people were, everybody. Were they getting makeup done? <laughs> they were getting their makeup did. Yes. So, yes, it, Angelina now even played along with a joke when Velvet left, and there was Winter in the mirror, and she says, oh, of course, Velvet left, and now you are here. Uh, not only is, I, I don't know if this is this is shocking or not, but the ghost also can read minds. Because the ghost explained, what happened was, Velvet said, listen, I love you, but I don't want you to come out for my match tonight with Sarita. I've got something to prove. I want to do this by myself. Boy, did she. And Angelina was, yeah, she did. Angelina was like, well, okay, no problem, sweetheart, blah, blah, blah. And then after Velvet left, Winter appeared and said, I know you're sad right now, but don't worry. I'll never leave you. She said you will never be alone again. So Angelina, God bless her, the worst actress, said, uh, basically she called her a creeper and uh, walked off. And then when she left, Winter was no longer in the mirror. That's right. So so when Angelina left, then we couldn't see Winter. So explain that one. It sucks. <laughs> That's my explanation. Wasn't the creeper one of the monsters or one of the ghosts on Scooby-Doo? Or just the creeper? <laughs> it's entirely possible. So, let me fun. speak of this next match. <laughs> I, I, the floor is mine here. Take it. Velvet Sky and Sarita had... An all-time horrible match. If you did not see this show, you need to... I don't know what you need to do. Remember what we said last week about the uh, Alberto De Rio Edge Rey Mysterio 3-Way, how you wanted to watch it again because it was so good? This is one you wanted to watch again because it was so bad. I don't encourage people to use torrent sites, but if you were ever going to, now is the time. YouTube, uh, uh, wherever you see this stuff, you've got to see this fucking match. This was, I, I don't know. This was like... Everything they did looked bad. I mean, it's one thing with, like, Jenna Maraska. That was really bad. I mean, that was historically bad as well. Oh, that was worse than this. But these two are trained. Mm-hmm. This was so atrocious. Like, I, I, I they, they did the worst lucha I think I've ever seen in my life. And uh, that's saying something, because I've watched a, uh, a fair deal of, of lucha. And uh, they botched every spot they tried. They nearly killed each other. And Sarita finally pinned her with a tiger suplex. And Velvet, who was supposed to be babyface, had a temper tantrum afterwards, pitched a fit, 
And uh, that was the end of legitimately. I mean, if this does not finish high in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Worst Match of the Year awards, I mean, obviously Jenna Maraska is going to win. I think that was this year, wasn't I it? I think that was a year ago. Maybe a year ago. But the, 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 if this does not finish in the top five, then uh, nobody's watching this show. Yeah, because exactly. this, this was. That is why it won't. Horrible. It was a very terrible match. But uh, yes, I also like the part where after. After screwing up all of Sarita's offense for several minutes, Velvet then cut her off and immediately stopped selling. Yeah. She, stopped, she was just happy again. Mm-hmm. So, yes, everything that could have been done poorly here was done poorly. Backstage, for some reason, Doug Williams and Kazarian were having an argument. Again. I, I, don't, I have no idea why. So, Flair told them that when the four horsemen had, had arguments, they settled them in the ring. Really? Maybe one time that happened. We, we, we saw a horseman versus horseman match. Yeah. I, it, I, I, I assume I have very vague memories of a time Arn Anderson wrestled Ric Flair, where I guess perhaps they were both technically horsemen. Other than that, I don't. You never saw Tully wrestling Barry Windham in a horseman versus horseman match, or Arn versus Oli. No. So they have no idea what they're doing. So then Doug decided he wanted uh, Christy Hemi to interview him. But suddenly, all of TNA's equipment broke. They had no microphones because they're a rink-eating company. Doug made fun of them for being disorganized because they are a rink-eating company. And then Ken Anderson's microphone dropped from the sky. I love this because Christy was completely baffled. She was confounded. She had no idea why this thing came down from the ceiling. She was the only one on the earth. So then we had Mickey James and Ink Ink against Generation Me and Tara. Don't ask. Do not ask how this combination of individuals was put together. I don't really know how to explain this. It was it was all action. I will say that. It was kind of fun. It was complete amateur hour. One of the big th- problems TNA has, and I can rattle off literally about uh, a billion. A billion of them. But one of the big ones is and God bless them. I've had Al Snow on the show. I'm sure Simon Diamond's a great guy. People have fond memories of D'Lo. Their agents suck. This match was a clusterfuck. There was a spot with Generation Me and Tara. I'm not entirely sure what they were trying to do, and I watched it like three times. I, it was like a combination... The choke thing? Assisted tarantula, maybe? I have absolutely no idea. Yes, I, I actually put the blame on it. Well, the agents sort of... Stopped from doing this at some point. Maybe maybe they kept it from the agents, but it's, it, it was just I, I blame Generation Me because they are the ones most likely to do something wacky simply because we have to be innovative. We can't just do a choke. No, we must do a double team wherein Tara sits on the person, then bends backwards, and then somehow leans onto the Generation Me guy. Although technically, if you think about it, that would actually alleviate pressure on the choke. So it didn't make sense. It was not particularly cool. It accomplished nothing. Just choke them on the ropes, especially when you are the heel. You know, Tara is like a prime example of how important agents are. Because if you remember in WWE, she had a rep of being a a pretty damn good worker. In TNA, she is horrible. And I like Tara. I like Mickey. I, I like Ink Ink. And Generation Me can be pretty good. <laughs> they have their days. They have their days. If you would have if you would have had this exact same combination in WWE with the WWE agents, Ricky Steamboat and such putting this match together, this would have been a fucking good top of the hour match, I would guess. That's probably true. In TNA it was a cluster. It was a giant cluster fuck. You gotta get you gotta get agents that like know what they're doing. I mean, do, do people sit back and go, Man, the days of Simon Diamond, what a worker. No. Did, did they say that no about one. Al Snow and D'Lo Brown? I'm sure they're great guys. They were solid hands. Okay, it's not like having Ricky Steamboat and guys like that. Gene and Malenko, Dean Malenko, Arn Anderson. Okay, are 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 good even IRS? Are good old workers really that hard to find? The answer is no. <laughs> they're all over the place to be utilized. So anyway, they they got to replace these guys because it it's. There's there's so much talent in TNA, and they should be having better matches than they are. So that was annoying. So then the faces eventually, they got the clean win, and you think, okay, great. One team beat another team. Fine. 
And then, of course, the heels lead them out and celebrated their music playing. Of course. So, this match accomplished nothing. We then got a horrendous segment. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Orlando Jordan and Eric Young went to a counselor. Couples counseling, I guess. No, they didn't go to a counselor. The counselor was at the impact zone. They couldn't do this on their off time. They had to do this during the on show. The <laughs> uh, during a live program, supposedly, they, they did this. Yeah. Yes, uh... I, it was just the shittiest segment of the year. I can't even describe it. It was supposed to be funny. Well, what what I think they were trying to do is Eric Young and Orlando are meeting with a therapist, and I think the idea is that Eric thought this was about their tag team, yeah. and Orlando thought it was about them fucking. I believe you're correct. That's the direction they wanted to go. And then Eric said approximately 250,000 words <laughs> during a two-minute segment, yes. and I was infuriated. It was not good. And then got a quick segment. It was 3D and Machine Guns talking about their match, joking around with each other. No, oh, actually, you missed a segment. I did? Jeff Jarrett was heading to the ring. I, yeah, I didn't write anything. I don't care. And Mike Tanay said, I wonder if he's going to apologize to Samoa Joe. Eight years, Mike Tanay, and you have no idea. <laughs> not just eight years. Every show for the past two years. Of course he's not going to apologize. Yes. As noted, I just didn't care. I didn't write anything down. So yeah, 3D machine guns were hanging out. They were joking with each other about... They, they, they were looking forward to their match, wanted to have a good match, wanted to, you know, do something special for the fans. 3D asked machine guns to leave their kicks at home. Machine guns said, no, they go with us wherever we go. Ha, ha, ha. And they agreed to have a good match and made the best team win on Sunday. It was different. I didn't hate it. This was like, um... Hmm. This was like when, when two guys are about to fight hug in the middle of the fight. Yeah, yeah it was, exactly, yes. But it, it was like it, would, it, it was such that you know... I'm trying to figure out... This is Vince Russo, so this is my prediction. Everybody's expecting Team 3D to turn on the guns, so the guns are going to turn heel on 3D. Sure. And 3D's just going to refuse to retire. They're so pissed off. That's entirely possible. There's my prediction, everybody. I mean, this was a, if you remember when, uh, when Rich Franklin stepped in for Tito Ortiz... And he was going to fight Chuck Liddell. And Rich and Chuck couldn't even pretend any kind of animosity was between them. It was yeah. It was like that, except these guys were a little funnier. So it was fine. He had uh, Jarrett came out. He Oh, this segment. <laughs> All right. Jeff Jarrett cut a promo on Kurt Angle, who is fired. Mm-hmm. He cut a promo on a fired man. He was upset that Kurt attacked Eric Bischoff and Ric Flair. He said he didn't need to be pissed with Eric. He needed to be pissed at. He did not need to be pissed at Eric. He should be pissed at Jeff. Then he. Uh, well, actually, moved on. I, I did. I did like that aspect of the promo in the sense that Kurt did come back and try to beat up Flair and Eric with a, a baseball bat before he was arrested, and and Jarrett was upset that he was the man responsible for for getting rid of Kurt Angle, and he wanted Kurt to remember that. He wanted everyone to remember that. He didn't want this this to be taken out on someone else. I see. He wanted full credit for being an asshole. That's fine. So he then uh, moved on to Samoa Joe. He said he was sorry. Sorry he didn't throw him off something higher. Never yeah. heard that line before. He, I believe he used it in his last promo. So the fans are chanting, you sold out, you sold out. He said, I didn't sell out, I bought in. His music played and he went to leave. Then a hole opened up on the ramp. Samoa Joe popped out like a trapdoor spider and attacked him. Then, Gunnar and Murphy made the save. My, the two most hated people on this program. Then, Samoa Joe cleared the ring. Then, his music played. Then, Gunnar and Murphy attacked him again. Then, Joe laid them out with a muscle buster. And then his music played again. Yeah. It's all in one segment. Yeah. You had a promo, a sneak attack, a save, a, uh, a comeback, a second sneak attack, another comeback. Yeah, Jesus Christ! <laughs> you got a shot of RVD saying he didn't know, did not know who to trust, and he was angry. AJ RVD and Rhino in a three-way for the TV title. They had an action-packed match. I will say that. AJ pinned RVD with a roll-up using the tights. Yes, and then AJ pinned RVD, which led to RVD and Rhino getting into an argument. Of course, even though neither of them pinned each other. Okay, so, you're, you're glossing over something here. All right. It's a three-way. They wanted to have AJ Styles win, and the candidates for having to pin Rhino or having pin Rob Van Dam. 
So AJ Styles pinned Rob Van Dam, the undefeated guy who was unfairly stripped of his world championship. Mm-hmm. Is this was his loss? Yeah, he lost in the three way to AJ Styles and Rhino. Uh huh. Stupid. So the eighty two guys came out. RVD shoved down Raven. Dreamer grabbed a mic. Said the bullshit needed to stop, and then the following happened, everyone. RVD said, why should I trust you guys? I trusted Jeff Hardy, and look what happened. I think he said I trusted Jeff Jarrett, but I presume he meant Jeff Hardy. Regardless, he trusted someone and and got screwed, was the point of this promo. So, Dreamer, he said, was leader of the group, and maybe he was responsible for all of these troubles. So... Dreamer's response to this, his solution to the problem, to defuse this situation, this false accusation, he challenged RVD to a fight at the pay-per-view. Really? That is what happened in this fucking segment. I don't know. So, we went from members of EV2 brawling with each other to members of Fortune brawling with each other. As we got Kazarian versus Doug Williams. Now, Kazarian and Doug Williams had a, a pretty good match. It was fine. What was not so fine was Ric Flair did commentary. And first off, he was so concerned about his men fighting that he was sucking on a, a lollipop throughout this entire deal. Mm-hmm. And he starts talking about how he said there was a, when there was a problem with two of his guys. He wanted to keep it internal. What? He wanted to keep it internal, so they're fighting each other on national television? I don't know. Is there a different definition of this term? I don't know. I know there is, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So, they have this match. Also in this match, they were sure to point out that the fans were cheering for both men. Mm Mm-hmm. Ric Flair pointed out that the fans were cheering for both heels. Yeah. So, they're both unfortunate. Everyone's sharing, he says. James Storm got on the apron. I have no idea why, because he didn't try anything. He was just up there. Kazarian ran the two of them together, Storm and Williams, and uh, rolled up Williams for the pin. Flair in the booth could not possibly have given a fuck less. I mean, it, it would have been possible for him to give a fuck less than he did. He was sucking on a popsicle or a lollipop while this match was going on. So he came down to the ring completely indifferent. He told both men to shake hands. They begrudgingly did so. And that was the end of the segment. I'm glad you told me about James Storm interfering. Because he didn't interfere. He got up on the apron for no he, conceivable reason. What he did. Because I was not looking at the screen when it happened. I heard a three count and the bell ring. And I looked up and Williams was angry. And they never showed a replay. I did not know not. what happened until you told me right now. Of course not. So we had... Well, well, there was also, by the way, a wacky promo with Abyss where he accused Pope of not being a real Pope. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. Yeah. So then we add Abyss and the Pope after more Orlando, Eric Young bullshit. Yeah, there was a joke here where Orlando said, I am bi, and Eric said, Polar. Mm-hmm. Ha, ha, ha. So Abyss faced Pope. They went about a minute, and then... Abyss started grabbing fake fans out of the crowd and beating them up, at least two of which fell right on their heads uh, on the cement. One of them hit the back of his head and looked like he actually might have been hurt pretty bad. The other guy took a header over the guardrail and landed on his head. So these were either untrained plants or or barely trained plants. Or actual fans. <laughs> which is always great to be beating up guys that don't know what they're doing. Yes. So, so hopefully nobody really got hurt here, but... Abyss is killing fans on a weekly basis. And, number one, he's not reprimanded. He's not fired. Yeah, I guess you could argue the the owners, the new owners like him, so it doesn't matter. You would think that they would be, uh, you know, cognizant of the possibility of lawsuits. Apparently not. So, the gimmick is that he is beating up fans randomly on a weekly basis. So, Pope's idea, as a babyface is to challenge him to a match on Sunday where they are going to put fans around the ring. This would be like if sharks were attacking people off the Florida coast, and so the government decided the solution was to put a bunch of fans in the water. (laughs) Is it not? I'm trying to think of a parallel with Frankenstein and villagers, but this is the same thing, yes. Am I missing something here? I, 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 Abyss is killing innocent fans 
in the crowd. So your idea to take fans and put them even closer to this man? Why not give him the bat while you're at it? It's like you were fighting an old school karate guy and you want the ring surrounded by boards. So you can break them. What? I don't know. That was horrible. I'm sorry. I'm tired. So, yes. I also just like, first of all, the idea is that Abyss is kidnapping, destroying, and murdering fans. The fans were buying so into this that not only do they not run away when Abyss attacks the plants, they run up to him and pat him. They want to get on television. And in fact, they bring signs that read, Abyss. So this is failing. And then just to top it all off, Pope is so horrified that Abyss is laying waste to four or five innocent fans here that he calmly gets in the ring and challenges him to a contest. For, forget about the stiff for a second. His idea of what to do about Abyss's heinous actions is to challenge him to a match at a later date. There's pay for you Sunday, Vince. When, when Robert Roode pumps Charmel, Booker T did not challenge him to wrestle a few days later. He went into apoplectic shock. Which is actually shocking, because this was TNA. Yes, that's, that's indeed. Then uh, we had Robbie E. Yeah. and Cookie doing a promo. And I didn't notice this until this week, but Robbie E. has nothing even resembling a Jersey accent. He sounds like a guy from Bothell. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe that's part of the gimmick. I don't know. But uh, she does have an accent, like, half the time. And uh, this all goes over my head. So, so this was when the show went off the air, because it was 11 p.m. So at 11.01, Eric Bischoff comes out with his contract for Mr. Anderson. He says he's going to make the announcement about the pay-per-view main event on reaction tonight. I guess it would be one thing if there were three weeks until the pay-per-view, but the pay-per-view is Sunday. So he had Bischoff read a pl- proclamation for Eric Bischoff versus Mr. Anderson. It was actually really funny, because everyone the gimmick was this was a fake match. And the fake match got a better introduction than any of the real matches that we're supposed to care about. Well, Eric Bischoff is supposed to be hated, but this proclamation that he had uh, Borash read was such that when Borash finally stopped to explain that Anderson really wasn't here, the fans began chanting, read it! Read it! Yes. He did the whole big announcement, like it was a, almost like it was a UFC fight and he was Bruce Buffer. He even said, introducing first... He uh, read Bischoff's karate credentials, a win-loss record, so many wins by TKO. Then he started introducing Anderson with a bunch of silly nicknames, including one that I actually laughed out loud at, the Barack Obama of head trauma. That's what he called him. That was funny. Bischoff challenged Borash to a fight. Borash didn't want to do it, so Eric gave him some goofy-looking shots. Then the lights went out, and Mr. Anderson's music hit, and everybody went nuts. They could not wait to see Mr. Anderson. Instead, Matt Morgan appeared in the ring. He laid out Eric with a jumping kick. And the moment he got the pin, they went off the air. (laughs) So then they come back on reaction, and Matt Morgan signs the contract. And there were people applauding, but the reaction that this got compared to the reaction of when they played Mr. Anderson's music, not even in the same galaxy. No. So, yeah, the pay-per-view is Sunday. It is going to be Matt Morgan against Jeff Hardy for the title and all of the other matches we talked about. And, again, if this breaks 8,000 buys, I will be confounded. I'm going to have to... That's my new favorite word. I'm going to say this. This is way, 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 way down the list of problems in DNA. But if Matt Morgan is going to be a babyface, if he's supposed to have fans cheering for him, he needs new music immediately. <laughs> Does. It's impossible to cheer when that song plays. Yeah. To the back! I'm joined at this moment by young Vincent. We're going to run down the TNA pay-per-view from Sunday night. And I think everybody knew going in that nobody was going to buy this show. Maybe that's a good thing for TNA because this was a show that fell off a cliff. If you're going to write a 13-word or, or 20-word recap of this pay-per-view, you can start by briefly just saying, This show fell off a cliff! And then you could continue with, first three matches, great, everything else, shit. Which is essentially the the, uh, short version of of how this pay-per-view went. It was a show that started out great, as noted, and then the final, I don't know, what, six matches? Five matches? I would say the final eight hours. Final eight hours of this show were really, really bad. The opener was Jay Lethal and Robbie E for the X title. 
It's a good match. I didn't see most of it, but the stuff I saw at the end was pretty good. Finish saw Lethal going up top after his big comeback. Snooki distracted him. Robbie E. hit the ropes. Crotched Lethal. Hit his rude awakening neckbreaker for the pin. Won the title. I will say that Robbie E. stole my heart by having the best fucking celebration I've ever seen for winning a title. Especially a title that is as pointless as the X title nowadays. So... Big thumbs up to him. Maybe the rest of the match. The, I, I've now seen enough of Robbie E. to say that he's a perfectly competent pro wrestler. I also like that he's a heel, so he does not go out and do a billion cool moves. He will do stomps. He will do clovering. He will use the ropes to cheat. He's a perfectly fine heel. His job is to make Jay Lethal look good, and fortunately that's not hard to do. So they had a very fun match. Snooki also, or excuse me, Cookie, also deserves credit for... Uh, every time she interfered, it made sense, and she was in I like how in your game. own review here you called her Snooky. In my own notes, you I, sent me. In my own notes, I actually wrote Snooky, yes. Hmm. So I made a mistake in every possible way. Regardless, she did her job just fine, too, and this was a great opener for the pay-per-view, or at least a good opener for the pay-per-view. Then we had Tara and Mickey James. For those of you that didn't see the entire pay-per-view, the entire pay-per-view was everything you ever wanted to know about TNA. It, it was just like, first three matches... They let people go out there and have wrestling matches, and the matches were all very good, featuring wrestlers that have talent. And then, after that, there were a bunch of either bad matches or matches with horrendous finishes. The best and worst of of TNA. This match here was the best and worst of TNA. The good news, we'll get the good news out of the way here first. They actually had a really good match per women's standards. I'm not going to say per TNA women's standards, because WWE's women's have not been up to par of late. Per any standard of female wrestling on a big-time stage in the United States, obviously not counting Shimmer and promotions like that, they had a really good match. It's actually like a WWE match from about three years ago, when they actually had talented girls doing wrestling matches. Such as these two. Yeah, Tara and Mickey James, who, by the way, were interviewed by Chrissy Hemme prior to this match. So it was a nice little WWE reunion here. And they did their match. It was very good. They did a bunch of stuff and ended up outside the ring. And this was where, well, this was where it became TNA. So they have this match. They're, they're, they're having a match like two girls that don't like each other, which you don't always see in, in wrestling matches. These these two girls acted like they hated each other, and they were having this, this, this brawl. And at the end of the match, it ends up outside the ring, and they proceed to lock up. They locked up on the floor. So they do this lock up. That is followed by an Irish whip on the floor. Now, granted, the Irish whip was reversed, and one of the girls went back first in the apron. But my first thought was, if this had not been reversed, what was your plan? You were going to Irish whip her up the ramp? hoping that she might keep running until she ended up in the backstage area and perhaps go out the back door into the night? What was your plan had she not done a reversal here? So, yeah, then uh, they got counted out, so this feud must continue. And then it was every TNA brawl that we've ever seen, which means it went on for about six hours. They fought and fought and fought and fought and fought. The brawl may have been longer than the match itself. Earth to TNA. Less is more. The idea is... Give us a tease, and then make us want to see more, as opposed to giving us every single thing, and then hoping that we're going to pay for it or want to watch it later. Now, I will say, I will be honest here, even though they fought for about 35 minutes after this match, the fans still chanted, let them fight when it got broken up. So maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. But still, this brawl just went on way too long for me. Taz, as always, is the voice of reason on TNA broadcasts. So they wrestled for like five minutes. They brawled for probably seven or eight uh, they were using all kinds of plunder. They used a broom. They used a garbage can. They used I don't know what else. They whipped each other into walls. They were finally separated by security, at which point Taz simply asked, why break them up at this point? <laughs> I don't have an answer. We had the Motor City Machine Guns against Team 3D for the TNA tag titles in supposedly Team 3D's retirement match. Now, I can't even complain about this yet, but I'm going to say this. Does anybody in the world believe that Team 3D is retiring? No. So what's the point? Don't know. I don't know either. But I do know they had a really good match. I gave this three and three-quarter stars. I actually did too. I, I was considering four. 
And I'll tell you why I didn't give it four stars. The reason is they worked really hard, and they did a bunch of great near falls. They kicked out of a bunch of stuff, and it built up to Team 3D finally hitting the 3D on, I believe, Alex Shelley. doesn't matter. The point is that whoever they hit it on kicked out, and the announcers played up that no one had ever kicked out of that move before. And come to think of it, I don't remember anyone ever kicking out of a 3D. It sounds like something that would, uh, it, it sounds like typical pro wrestling announcer bullshit. But then you think about it, most of the Dudley's big WrestleMania matches were ladder matches. Yeah. So in their biggest matches, there would have been no kickouts. Um, I think it's probably not true, but it could be. So their move gets kicked out of, and they are taken out of the game. They have absolutely no idea how to respond to this. It has never happened before, supposedly. So they're taken completely out of their game, and all of a sudden they try to uh, hit the move again. The baby faces slip out. I guess they're the baby faces. I, I actually don't know. It was a baby face match. Hit the double super kick on Bubba. Hit their uh, finisher off the top for the pin. And all I have to say is that this would have been an awesome, legit retirement match. And maybe they're really going to retire. You never know. Never say never. I can never say that... Actually, I don't know how to turn that into a, a never say never deal about this match. But I will say that this was so great that I know I shouldn't, but I cannot help. I'm going to get so pissed off when Team 3D doesn't retire. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, this was such a great way to go out. They had a really great match. Yeah. Someone finally kicked out of their move. Yes. They lost to the tag team champions, the better team. Mm -hmm. It's time for them to go. It would be... It's one thing if they are on Thursday's show, specifically having a match. <laughs> that, I don't expect them to have a match on Thursday. That would bother me. If, 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 if they are back in late 2011... Oh, I, ha, 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 yes. ha, ha. Well, there you go. Seriously. You have made my point. If they're, if they're not back by the end of November, I'll be stunned, to yes. be honest with you. <laughs> well, yes. The, 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 my biggest complaint about the match itself is just that they, they, uh, three, uh, Machine Guns hit all their moves... And the Dudley's kicked out of everything, and then Dudley's hit 3D, and then Machine Guns kicked out, as you noted. And then, at that point, we had already seen everything. And so when the Machine Guns finally did hit Skull and Bones and for the win, it came off as pretty anticlimactic. But other than that, yes, three and three quarter star match, best match in the show by a mile, and a solid thumbs up. Then we had RVD. And that was the end of the good stuff. RVD versus Tommy Dreamer. And the big problem was that Tommy Dreamer hurt himself on a frog splash. And apparently on Tommy Dreamer's Twitter, he announced that, I did not break my wrist, but I've got to go to the doctor to find out what's wrong because there's a bone sticking out. I don't know what doctor made this diagnosis, but to me, when I have a bone sticking out, it's broken. So anyway, he hurt himself and... There was that time stood still moment where they have to decide what to do, and they decided, let's keep working. And, of course, it was really no good from that point. And it really was not all that good. Say, it's not all that good leading up to the broken It's not like you're having a good match that was spoiled by a freak injury. No. They were having a bad match that got worse after a freak injury. And it was just like, it wasn't even like, it wasn't even like the Velvet Sky match on Impact where they just didn't know what they were doing. Just like two guys going out there, having a match that nobody cared about, and they clearly didn't really care all that much about it until Dreamer got hurt. Then he cared. And just didn't click. I, I gave it a star and a half. I found the whole thing sad. RVD missed a couple of frog splashes and then finally hit it on the third try and got the pin. They worked hard, but... This was not a good match. No. And, uh, it's always good every once in a while to watch wrestling with people who don't see it regularly. The first comment we have from the non-wrestling fan was looking at Dreamer. She asked, why is he in a shirt? <laughs> that looks silly. Yeah. I tried to explain that were he not in a shirt, he would look even sillier, but she was having none of it. Time went by, and then another girl said about him, that dude doesn't even look like a wrestler. He just looks like some dude who put boots on. Well, that's his gimmick, basically. <laughs> yes, that's true. Perhaps she called it. Maybe, maybe he's this very is not a criticism. Yes, very effective at his gimmick. Yes. Yeah, so they had a sloppy match. They were doing. 
they tried to do some chain spots at the beginning that were just walk through speed. Just and by bad, the way, bad, bad. The kittens were so the highlight of this evening. Thank God you have cats. They were so much better than this pay per view. Oh yeah, there's a picture up on my Facebook right now that everybody needs to go see. Facebook.com slash Brian Alvarez. It's the cutest picture I've ever taken, like, in my entire life. I think it was during this match that Whitney started playing with the cats in a balloon. It was later on. It was later. But they played for a long, long time. Yeah. These little buggers can jump high, straight up in the air. It, you have, they will be jumping much higher as they age. I've seen, cats can jump. Yeah. They're great athletes, these cats. So after this match, they cut backstage, and there's Ric Flair, who, who, almost using these exact words, says, Thank God that match is over. Nobody gave a fuck. That's almost exactly That's very, what he very said. Close. He yeah. just said, "Nobody give me a damn." Yeah. So then they uh, did a promo saying they were going to end EV2 once and for all. It was a great babyface promo. Uh, heel promo. No, it was a babyface promo. I see. They are heels, but it was a great babyface promo. All right. Then we had the ten man tag, which was Kazarian, AJ, Beer Money, Douglas Williams against Rhino Sabu, Stevie, Raven, and Kendrick. Kendrick was taken out of the match immediately, selling a knee injury. They wrestled for a long time. It was fine. I gave it two and a half stars. The only in TNA moment of this particular match was I thought the stipulations were that the winning team got to fire a man on the losing team. I was later alerted by Dave that only someone from EV2 would be fired if EV2 lost. If Fortune lost, nobody would be fired. Now, first off, what's the point of the stipulation? It's just stupid. Why not? So, then, during the match, Taz says, maybe Kendrick is faking an injury to avoid getting fired. And I'm sitting here going, well, no, because number one, he's supposed to be a babyface. And number two, the steps are that the winning team gets to fire someone of their choice. So they could pin Kendrick and fire Sabu, for example. So the match goes on and on, and they end up pinning Sabu, who, as everybody is well aware, was told last week that he was done after the pay-per-view, and, and uh, essentially he let the world know. So they pin Sabu, and the announcers immediately state that Sabu is done! So Flair then goes up on the ramp, and he starts cutting a promo about how he gets to choose who's fired. So he then chooses Sabu and announces that Sabu is fired. And seriously, everybody, is there any other wrestling promotion in the world besides WCW that could have shit like this happen? The announcers and Ric Flair and the fans at home, nobody had any idea what the stipulations were. So what's the point of the stipulations? What is the point of the stipulations if nobody even knows what they fucking are? He wanted an excuse to fire Sabu. This was such amateur hour bullshit that everybody was on a different page. So then he's saying goodbye, Sabu, and I laughed heartedly at the uh, song. I like even more than the song. I liked when he does his first words were, Sabu, I didn't like the Sheik, I hated the Sheik, and you're out of here. Yeah. So then Dreamer cried, as always. He said if anyone deserved to be a multimillionaire due to what they put their body through, it was Sabu. And uh, I was kind of sad for Sabu because here he was getting his big goodbye on a show that probably 8,000 people bought. And literally, I swear to God, Monday night's free edition of Wrestling Observer Radio more people will be aware of Sabu's firing than, than we're aware of it on this evening who watched this pay-per-view. That is a sad, sad stat. Pope did a promo, started by a bunch of black fellas, and he said they were members of his congregation, including a man named Moses, and another man he said was his brother, who I'm pretty sure was his brother because he looked exactly like the Pope. I can't believe you know that one of them was named Moses, but did not know that one of them was named Jim Bob. <laughs> I want to know more about Moses. Let's be honest. So uh, no, hey, hang on. I can believe that Pope would hang out with a guy named Moses. That didn't that didn't faze me at all. The Pope hangs out with a guy who looks like Pope, dresses like Pope, and calls himself Jim Bob. That's not Pope's fault. That's what his parents named him. 
I okay. I bet Jim Bob was on his birth name, but we'll that was on. Jim in Virginia, actually, now that I think about it. So apparently these men were gonna be the lumberjacks. I could have sworn it was going to be the fans as the lumberjacks, but I was wrong. I suppose Pope's actual words were that the lumberjacks would be his congregation. I see. But I assumed it would be fans because the whole angle was built around fans. And he calls the fans his congregation. Yes. And by the way, just to uh, clarify here, the reason this match was taking place was because Abyss was beating up innocent fans. Right. So Pope decided to bring his friends? To bring other people. His No, his buddies. Yeah. Not just random fans now. He wanted his buddies to be around the ring where this crazed madman was going to be grappling. So anyway, they have the match. Actually, before that, Pope finished his promo. Oh, yeah. And then there was a ruckus to the side. Tara and Mickey James came through. So you're missing the key to this ruckus, which was Pope, after cutting this great promo, pauses and then very calmly says, what the hell? And that is when the brawl occurred. And then the brawl broke out, and there was Tara and Mickey James, whose match had ended in hour two, hour one. This is now uh, starting the hour, hour three. So they've been brawling for hours. 120 minutes, yeah, per that's... my calculations. That's quite impressive. And they were not blown up. The cardio was very impressive. And uh, they fought for a long time. Pope and his friends just split. Didn't care. And uh, then Madison Rain came in and laid out Mickey. And I guess this feud is continuing. Then we had Abyss and the Pope with the congregation outside. It was your typical lumber... Well, actually, it wasn't your typical lumberjack match because the babyface had ten lumberjacks and the heel had zero lumberjacks. Right. So... Of course. So uh, every time he got thrown outside, he was beaten. Yeah. Every time he got thrown outside, he was helped. Yeah. This so, is yeah. This is backwards. The crap out of Abyss, this and that. And then, of course, at the end of the match, Pope's outside and Bischoff comes out and rubs his fingers together to indicate money talks. Pope's buddies and his own brother turn on him, and then Abyss pinned him with the black hole slam. This finish was so offensive to ticket-buying customers that I give it a big, fat fucking dud. That's what I did, too. And again, it was not a good match before the shit finish. Unless you're a big fan of, say, a bear hug. <laughs> There's a very long bear hug in this match. Yeah. Just this show. Stevie challenged AJ for Impact on Thursday, because that's the point of the pay-per-view. You, you build up the free show. And we had Jeff Jarrett versus Samoa Joe. This whole thing just infuriated me. Listen... I know that, I know that again, I mention this every time I talk about impact, there are people who believe that I am biased. Now, if you're one of those people, I want you to be honest with me. Does any TNA fan in the world still give a fuck about Jeff Jarrett in the semi-main event in 2010? Almost 2011? Impossible. The semi-main event. I don't even know why these guys are feuding. I know that Jeff Jarrett threw him off something. That's all I know. He's fine now, I have by the no way. fucking idea why we should care. Everybody falls off shit on this show, and nobody ever gets hurt. Why should we care about this stupid match? So, they had a match. It was boring. And then the rep took a bump. And then Gunner and Murphy ran in. And then Joe got choked out with a nightstick. And then Jeff put Joe in a rear naked choke. And the ref gave Jarrett the win. Two shit finishes in a row. This one. A big fat dud. And I would like to add, during this match, the fans were chanting for a Kurt Angle because not a single fucking person on the earth believes that Kurt Angle is retired. Which again begs the question, why do you bother with the stupid stipulation? I don't know. I found this finish to be far more offensive than the prior because... Because Gunner and Murphy were involved. That is, that's that sucks. When I write Death of TNA, you know who's going to be on the cover? Gunner and Murphy. Gunner and Murphy, and no one else. The subtitle will be These Two Fuckers. The... Oh, it's going to be called Death of TNA, Gunner and Murphy. <laughs> it's going to be the name of the book. There you go. The, the At least there is somewhere to go with the Pope bullshit in that now perhaps he is going to get a match with his brother. There's... Something there coming out of it. Who are Gunner and Murphy? I don't know. What a stupid storyline. It's Gunner and Murphy. It's Shawn Michaels brings in Diesel. He's fucking seven feet tall and a badass. And he kills everyone. We've got Gunner and Murphy. First off, Gunner, Murphy, okay, Diesel. 
Murphy. Don't forget Gunner. Gunner and Murphy. Go on. And, and, and the key of that, well, no, I have more to add to this. The key of that is Diesel was a complete badass who went to the Royal Rumble and tossed out like eight guys and was pacing the ring by himself before finally being eliminated. He was a former IC champ. Gunner and Murphy get their asses kicked every time they're on TV. Next time I go to Tulalip, I'm going to get two bodyguards. They're both going to be about 115 pounds, and they're going to be named Franklin and Erasmus. <laughs> Franklin and, and uh, Fauntleroy are going to be my, my, my two security guys. They're going to be smaller than me, and they're always going to get beat up. And I'm going to make sure they're on every show, interfering in every main event. You need to go even smaller than that. Get, get high school girls. Sure. <laughs> I'll, be no, that work. I'll be a baby face. True. So, anywho, th- this is the one where I noted that, yes, you, you paid for this finish, everyone. If you watch this show, you paid to see Joe get screwed. And Jeff Jarrett winning semi semi main events on pay per view in 2010. We had Eric Bischoff backstage celebrating the Brotherhood. They at least said they were going to watch the main event before they went and partied. Mm-hmm. I was flabbergasted that they would bother to plug that. Jeff Hardy and Matt Morgan for the TNA title. Close your eyes and imagine this match. That's what you got. Jeff, is it? I least... actually I disagree. I, 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 it was worse than that. You expected better. Aside from, I, aside from the the phantom pinfall, you really expected better. No, I was referring to the phantom pinfall. Oh well, forget that for now. The idea is they they had a, a very below average match, which is is uh, actually probably a positive given the uh, match on paper, and there was a phantom pinfall. What happened was, first off, I got to give Jeff Hardy credit. This was his first ever match as a heel in a main event. And granted, he got cheered half the time. But he really tried to be disliked. He really did. He really tried to be hated. Which is more than I can say for 95% of the heels in TNA, who apparently want to be beloved or are just booked to be beloved. So he at least tried. And they have a match. It really was not very good, as noted. And Morgan makes a comeback. Oh, and by the way, the twist of hate? Awesome. So Morgan makes a comeback, and he hits a big kick to the face. He covers Jeff. The ref counts one, the ref counts two, Jeff doesn't kick out, the ref just stops. Mike Tanay goes, what? The referee looks at Morgan, Morgan looks at the referee, no one has any idea what's going on. The match proceeds to just continue. They keep wrestling for a while, Jeff hits a twist of hate, Matt kicks out, Jeff hits another twist of hate, gets the pin. They show two replays of the phantom kickout. Boxer. Both, both, by the way, showing that his shoulder did not even come close to kicking out. Oh, he, he had a leg spasm. That he, is the most I can say. He barely wiggled. Yes, his, his one leg did lift up and then come down onto the referee. I'm sure they've got a hell of a storyline based off this for Thursday. But for a pay-per-view match that we paid for, shit. What Listen, shit? I know, I know that people are going to say, Brian, maybe this is part of the storyline. Maybe the referee was paid off by Eric Bischoff, and we're going to find out on Thursday. I don't want to fucking find out on Thursday what I paid fucking forty four ninety five for today. Correct. That is stupid. I paid forty four ninety five for a pay per view, and in the main event, you're booking an angle that I have to tune in Thursday to find out what the fuck happened. That's why no one buys this shit anymore. So anyway, this uh, I gave it a star. I was being nice. But uh, this pay-per-view collapsed. This pay-per-view was no buys. This pay-per-view was the stock market in October 08. That's what this show was. To the back! All right, let's uh, get going on Impact here. Vinny, get to work. Impact, Impact opened with the usual pay-per-view recap montage, including a detailed shot of the part where Matt Morgan covered Jeff Hardy and Jeff didn't kick out and the ref stopped counting, which looked like a giant fuck-up, and they put it here in the video package. It would become part of a story, as we learn later. We then had every single person on earth come out and cut a promo. Eric Bischoff talked for a long time, talked about how great his crew was. Hulk Hogan came out. He's still alive. <laughs> the highlight of this, and maybe the highlight of the entire show, Hulk asked us, do you know what it feels like to be surrounded by nothing but family? And somebody in the crowd shouted, Thanksgiving! True. Yes. True. So, the brought Jeff out, and then Hulk presented him with the new TNA Championship belt. 
Brian sent me a text about this. I, I, he's told, he reminded me to watch Impact. And I said, but I don't want to. He said, you should check it out just to see Jeff's new belt. And I immediately thought, uh-oh, they let Jeff design this, didn't they? Then I saw the belt. And yes, Jeff Hardy or one of his screw-up friends designed this belt. It was one of his wacky friends. It is purple. It has a giant silver face on the front, which I guess is supposed to be Jeff's makeup face. It's significantly uglier than the Divas title as the TNA World Championship belt. So It really is the ugliest belt I've ever seen. It's terrible. Also, meanwhile, James Storm is in the background of the ring here wearing a cowboy hat covered in spikes. I thought that was notable. So, eventually the Pope interrupted. He was upset about the betrayal of his family, and so he vowed to put Eric in a casket. Shouldn't you be mad at your family? They sold you out. This guy just paid them. Yeah, well. So this caused uh, Joe to come out. He was pissed at Jarrett. Then RVD came out. He was pissed at Jeff Hardy. And Matt Morgan came out. He was also pissed at Jeff Hardy. But he talked more about wanting a match with Hogan. So clearly Jeff, uh, excuse me, Matt Morgan and Hulk Hogan win wrestle at some point. That should be awful. Everything this, about this was horrible. This was 23 motherfucking minutes. 23 minutes and... It would be one thing if, like, all these people came out and, and the fans were into all of these storylines. The fans didn't give a shit about anything here. Like, they didn't give a shit about anything. And that made this drag even worse. And the stuff they did care about was, like, they chanted for Jeff Hardy, which yeah, exactly. felt was being dropped down through the ring. A lot of people chanting Hogan's name, too. Yeah. Yes. Way to go building baby faces and heels here, you goddamn idiots. So then, after commercial, we went, went I backstage. got more to say. All right. Jeff Jarrett challenging Samoa Joe to a shoot fight. Oh, that's or right. Or vice versa. Joe yes. wants to shoot with, with Jeff Jarrett. So, hold on a second. So, so what happened in that match? So, it, let me guess. It was, it was fake, and, and, and Jeff shot on him and put him in a sleeper? What happened here? Because now Joe wants to shoot. That's what he said, yes. Because everything else in the show is fake. But the match couldn't have been fake. So he's so mad at a fake match that he wants to shoot? I guess so. Or are we supposed to believe that the match was real, but now he wants to shoot? I don't know. What don't... the fuck's the difference between a real wrestling match and a shoot? Stupid bullshit. And Morgan comes out, and he does this promo saying he needs the next title shot. And, again, nobody cared. And so Morgan says... Jeff, I exposed your ass in the middle of the ring, one, two, three, and I'll be happy to do it again. What? I I know what happened. I know what happened, and I know they did show a couple of clips of it, but (laughs) you fucking lost, (laughs) and now you deserve another title shot? Yes. Yes. Well, that, that, that's something that's something that's going on in both companies for Not the entire year. Not to mention, this was 22 minutes into the show. The very least they could have done was shown a replay of the Phantom Pinfall there before they before they announced it again. Because literally, no one bought this show. This show may have done 8,000 buys. Yeah, they showed it in the opening video package, but that was, that was 20 minutes prior. So the other 1.5 million people, can you remind them of what fucking happened? Anyway. Yes. It and, sucked. Yeah, they're, 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 the the whole uh, shoot fighting thing came up when Bischoff mentioned that there may be some TNA fans out there who have checked out something called MMA or UFC. Yeah. And first I thought that was a hor- horrifically stupid thing to say, and I thought about it. It's probably true that some TNA fans have checked out UFC at one point or another. If you said the opposite, that UFC fans are checking out TNA, that would have been bullshit. There's no way that's happening. So, after all of this and the commercial break... We went backstage for more talking. Hulk and Flair and Eric were discussing the silliness, and they were treating it like that. Silliness. They were not impressed with all that, what just happened. So, Hogan for Revenge booked Joe versus Gunner and Murphy. Now, what he did was he booked the Samoan Joe, the ultimate submission machine, against Gunner and Murphy. <laughs> I missed that detail. The Samoan Joe. <laughs> Joe the Samoan. Yeah. Anyway. So, yes, yeah, so we'll get to that later. He then was so mad at RVD that he booked him in a match with Kaz with a chance to become the number one contender. And then finally, Matt Morgan versus Beer Money and Doug Williams. And then at the end of this, Flair told Hulk it was time to go look at the new talent. And he said, I believe, you won't believe the pussy around this place. 
Mm-hmm. It was bleat, but that seems to make the most sense. Robbie E. and Cookie did a promo backstage where Cookie said she was not a wrestler, but she was from Jersey and she could fight, which led to a match where she absolutely did not want to have anything to do with any physical physicality whatsoever. Taylor Wilde and Jay Lethal against Robbie E. and Cookie. This match was taped twice. Now, really? Yeah. The first one was so bad that they taped it again. And this is the best they could do? <laughs> well, here's the deal. When I heard about this on Monday, I said, Dave, I'll bet you anything they play the wrong match. And he was like, well, it's TNA. Very possible. So I watched this match, and it is fucking horrendous. Yes. And so last night I, I said, Dave, we got to figure out tomorrow if they did in fact air the wrong match. So today somebody texted me a WWE source and they said, did they play the wrong match last night? And I said, I, I don't know. And their response was, that is what several people in WWE believe. So I don't know if this is just everybody drawing conclusions because the match was so bad they must have aired the second this one. This could not possibly have been the better of the two. Or if they actually did air the second one. So I don't know. But if there was a match worse than this... I actually want to see it. I, I desperately want to see it. This match was so unbelievably bad. Cookie did not want to tag in, and she ran in at one point. There was there was a, a game of tag. Uh, I, I I I don't even know what to say. I this won't. this was a this was a different sort of horrible, but it was exactly as horrible as Velvet Sky and Cerita last week, and maybe even worse. A horrible match. It was the whole thing was done in slow motion. I'm going to try and summarize the finish. Basically, the girls got involved. Cookie's boot came off. And Lethal was holding it in his hand. And then as the girls chase each other around the ring, Lethal still had the boot in his hand. And by the way, you need to talk a little bit more about the chasing around the ring. Cookie is trying to run with one boot on, and, and she's, she can't do it. And so she's running at the speed of continental drift. And Taylor Wilde has to pretend she can't catch her. Yeah. And meanwhile, Taylor Wilde... I hate to say this, but she's put on some weight. And her boobs have also gotten bigger. And her apparently she's wearing the same tops because her boobs are spilling out of her top. And she's trying to do the slow run and not catch the girl who's running even slower. You're paying much more attention to this than I did. Well, at the same time, grabbing her tits and trying desperately to keep them inside her top. Yeah, I watched this finish about eight times. Just more gobsmacked at each passing time that I saw it. Well, I did not notice this because I noticed what was going on inside the ring, which is Lethal was watching the race. And it did take a long time. I didn't notice that. He watched them go from side to side to side to side. And as he did this, Robbie E. recovered. And then he walked up to Jay Lethal, took the boot away from him, and waffled him with it. They couldn't have even had Jay put the boot down. No. Robbie had to commandeer it. And willed it against him to make to look like the biggest geek of all time. Kevin Nash would have lapped these girls <laughs> like twice. This is not a shining moment for the knockout. Andre division. the Giant running backwards would have lapped these girls twice. This was horrible. I cannot even believe. Listen, you tape it once, it's shit. You tape it again, if it's still this bad, you just don't don't air it. A fucking video package. Get an explosion, man. Another promo. Anything. Holy Christ, this was bad. There's also here, and this actually has nothing to do with TNA, but I want to uh, I want to touch on it. There was an amazing commercial somewhere in the, before this match. It was for a company called Western Sky. They explained this was a native-run company on native reservation land, which presumably means they have different rules as it applies to interest rates and whatnot, because... They're a short-term loan co- loan company, and the commercial is just a stern Indian looking into the camera. He has long black hair tied into uh, uh, braids, and he tells you they will they will give you a loan till payday. And he says, and this is very stern, it's not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> he did say it was cheaper than a payday loan, but he let you know this is basically 
a, a, a an honest loan shark. Yeah. He says, if you are fucked, we will help you get more fucked. Yeah. Okay. If it works. Holy God. So, we had a... What was the text that Caden sent you? Oh, that's right. I forgot. Caden, Caden sent me a text the other day. Everybody. I was thinking of indie wrestling and, and how this Taylor Wilde and uh, Cookie uh, debacle was worse than anything that has ever been in the ring at Tulalip by leaps and bounds. And keep in mind all the matches Vinny has had. Okay, so uh, the last Tulalip show, I was the ring announcer. Mm-hmm. I, was the, I was the inside the ring announcer. There was also an outside the ring announcer because, well... You have to have two ring announcers. I mean, come on now. I guess that's it. So, then the last show I missed because we went to Norm. So, I get this text from Caden Matthews. I am giving you your notice. 60 days, no compete, announce clause. Happy holidays. See you next year. What? I have apparently been let go <laughs> from my announcing duties. So, I replied, do you realize I will be reading this on the show? And then he says... You will be the biggest baby face ever. Still welcome to come. I have not been banned until I live. Lynch's friend announced last show and wants to do it again. So that's that's how that's I'm, why announcers never take a day off, Vinny. I guess so. Wow. I've been I've been you've demoted. been fired as a ring announcer. Yes. That's astounding. And then dump me a text. Wow. And a 60-day no-compete, too. I can't go compete. I can't go bring announce in Oregon. Jesus. Yes. So, speaking of silliness, we had a Team 3D career retrospective video package consisting entirely of shots of them in TNA with one picture from Japan. That we need to do an invasion angle on Tulalip, but a shoot one. Just, I like, show up and, and have our own wireless mic and start doing ring intros. <laughs> You know what I mean? I'm just bring a megaphone. We don't want to actually wrestle beat. anybody. We no. just want to take over the ring announcing. I'd do that. Where I, were we? Freedy. Oh, yeah. So they came out. This was the most embarrassing segment of the year. This was so... They came out, and they say goodbye, and nobody believes it. And there are a couple of half-hearted, please don't go chants or whatever, and... They do their deal. Bubba's going to start a rock band. Devon's going to mentor his two kids to be the next Team 3D. And Devon says, for the last time ever, let's do this. And he does the, oh, my brother. And everyone half-heartedly goes, testify. And then Bubba hits him with a forearm from the back, and it is met with dead silence. Yeah. Then a couple of guys go, boo. And then a few other guys go, Yay! And then it's dead silence. This is not... I wish I could put, like, a reverberation effect on this as I do it. I wonder if I can do that. Well, it was... Right, while you look for that, it wasn't quite dead silence because they played their music. Because they both cut the goodbye promos, they embraced, then they started playing the theme song, and then Bubba Ray hit Devon in the back of the forearm, and the music kept playing over and over and over again. Which kind of killed the mood, but also it was funny to me because the, their music consists entirely of a guy saying, watch out, watch out, watch out, over and over again. And if Devon had listened to his music, <laughs> Bubba never would have hit him. Yeah, I can't find the reverberation effects to make it sound like we're in an empty hall, but uh, that's what this was. Man, I can't even get mad. Like the other day on the show, I was like, you know, I'm going to get mad when they don't retire because it's such a great retirement match. But uh, they followed it up with this. <laughs> you guys did a really, really great retirement match. Supposed retirement match, obviously. But this was your big fucking comeback uh, four days later. Sad. I actually was sad for them. Yeah. This was so pathetic. And that's saying something. Because I, I uh, have no, I have no, I have no nothing for this group. But I was actually sad for Team 3D. This was so pathetic. So then we had a segment that this was the most pissed off I got during the show. Eric Bischoff was backstage chewing out the refs. Yeah. Apparently, as far as I can gather, he was very upset about the call in the main event of the pay-per-view that allowed his man, Jeff Hardy, to retain the title. Yeah. This enraged him. So he's chewing out all the refs, not just the guy who called the match, all of them, because apparently the referees decided who refs which match. Sure, Earl Hebner decides. Earl Hebner made that decision. 
Eric Bischoff did not. So even though he is in charge, he thinks it was not his fault. So he was yelling at them for that. He should have been happy the whole time. Morgan finally came into the room to defend the ref who screwed him and cost him the title. Yeah. He uh, wanted to give the guy another chance. He wanted him to be referee his match tonight against Beer Money and Doug Williams. So Bischoff said, fine. Now, here's how screwed up TNA has made my mind. I assumed this was all an elaborate plot by Eric Bischoff to get the heel ref into Matt Morgan's match and have Matt Morgan trust him. As it turns out, no. The referee is a decent man who made an honest mistake. You know who that ref is, don't you? Yes, it's Jackson James. No, but you know who that is? No. It's Eric Bischoff's son. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. So in the end, he is going to be a heel ref. I guess so. But still, still, what? <laughs> First off, as stupid as it was for Eric Bischoff to be angry that the referee had fucked his man, which makes no fucking sense, then Matt Morgan comes in and defends the guy, and then they build up for the referee being in the main event, and the referee just does absolutely nothing but call down the middle. Yeah, yeah and then he has no impact in the main event at all. This was so stupid. God, I hated this. And speaking of stupid, in the next segment, we had Samoa Joe versus Gunner and Murphy. Okay, Why does on. TNA <laughs> always have to have a random pair of impotent security guys? I don't know. This has been eight years, and they just go through one impotent security force after another. There was the red shirt security. What is it about then this fucking There was the Harris twins, and now there is Gunner and Murphy. The bottom of the barrel. Here's everything that happened in this segment, guys. Samoa Joe won the match in a minute. He beat one guy with a muscle buster. Then the other guy tried to, tried to attack him. Joe beat him up too. I, one of the announcers said, and this is a quote, it looks like Gunner and Murphy are going to have to get some more guys. <laughs> At that point, Jeff Jarrett jumped Samoa Joe from behind. They were going to beat him up. And then Kurt Angle, who had retired, ran into the retired. ring. Forced to quit, whichever. Yeah. Kurt Angle returned. Ran into the ring to make the save, threw some suplexes, the bad guys bailed, all of that. Everything I just talked about went by in three minutes. Yeah. And then they cut to the back. And, and by the way, Angle was never seen again. No. None of these guys were. So we cut to the back. I, I assume there was a commercial here. It was Bischoff, Flair, and Hogan being angry again. Flair said, again, a direct quote, I don't know what's wrong with Gunnar and Murphy. <laughs> I Let don't me know. Count the ways. I don't know what's wrong with Gunnar and Murphy. Can someone point out anything to me right with Gunnar and Murphy? <laughs> what have they ever done correctly? So Bischoff was scurred. The angle was in the building. You're missing the very important point here. Flair said, "That's it. They're done. Finished. Fired." It's maybe the end of Gunnar and Murphy. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is how they were written out. I don't know. Bischoff was scurred. He left. He demanded Abyss to stick with him and watch his back. We came back from commercial. Eric Bischoff was in the bathroom. I was very curious why the camera crew had followed him in there. TNA did something right here when Eric Bischoff turned on the camera and demanded they follow him so in case anything happened to him, it was on tape. So then Pope attacked him. He laid out. He beat up Eric, laid out Abyss, and they kidnapped Eric. Kidnapped Eric, And the, indeed, the camera crew filmed it all. Mm -hmm. It was all documented. RVD and Kaz had an acceptable match. Ref took a bump. Flair came out with a chair. Rhino hit the ring to make the save. They did the deal they always do where the babyface stands there for an extended period of time. So you absolutely know exactly what's going to happen. He speared RVD and turned heel and clobbered him with a chair. Or Dreamer, when Dreamer came out, he clobbered him with a chair. And Mike Tanay calmly said, what's behind his actions? <laughs> No one cares anymore. No, I'm trying to figure out what, how heinous an actor he will have to commit to actually get a reaction out of anybody. You're missing a key point here. During Rob Van Dam's entrance, Mike Tanay noted that Rhino's contract had expired and was not being renewed. Mm -hmm. So in storyline, Rhino was fired on commentary during an entrance. <laughs> yeah. That would suck. So they had a match. It was not and very RBD good. And RBD had to beat a man whose contract expired. In order no, no, no. to get a shot. No, that was Rhino's contract expired. Yeah, RVD had to beat a man whose contract had expired. He was wrestling Cass. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, 
I don't care. <laughs> I literally don't care. So yes, yeah, so, and then the, the the hit the ring for the Rhino was in there for no reason after being fired. This when you talk about the 3D thing being the most embarrassing part of the show, this is the one where I was just I, I just felt dirty watching it because it was the swerve that could not have fooled anyone. No one could have thought that Rhino was going to attack Kazarian. Everyone on Earth knew Rhino was going to to, to score RVD. It was a swerve that fooled no one. Then Tommy Dreamer ran into the ring. I don't know what happened, but he opened his mouth and like a gallon of water poured out. It was like he had, <laughs> he had chugged a one liter <laughs> bottle of water and then spread it down to the ring and then began to speak without I swallowing. I do not know what that was about. But he, he opened his mouth and, and the Red Sea parted out of his guts. <laughs> And he fan asks loudly, Why are you spinning? <laughs> this is the DNA impact of the one. <laughs> where a waterfall where poured from his mouth. He's like one of those fish. You know those fountains that have a fish that water flies out of his mouth? <laughs> so Tommy Dreamer was in this angle for no good reason. He was a vomiting fish. He was just melting. <laughs> That's my theory. He is a witch. Oh, this is so stupid. So, backstage, a beer shit. We had what it turned out to be, for the first time in tw- twice in a 24 hour period, Pope had Eric Bischoff, he was not tied up, but he was torturing him. He forced him to do a bad Pope impression, and we were supposed to laugh at him. Because you see, it was a torture scene done for comedy. Yeah. That was what <laughs> this was. Ha 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 ha. So. Hogan sent Abyss after Eric to save him. He had AJ Styles versus Stevie Richards. They attempted to steal the Shawn Michaels Sultan Benjamin finish. Stevie Richards is not, has never been, and will never be Shawn Michaels. Yeah. It didn't work. So then the finish, which apparently, because I saw the post saying this was all an angle, this apparently is what they meant to do. Now, let me tell everybody about this. Go on. I, I didn't even get into this enough last night. As I mentioned with Dave... Moments after this occurred, I started getting texts from people who who said, my God, Stevie just took a terrible pile driver. I think he's hurt. And, of course, Stevie has a bad neck. They said it was a bot styles clash. He was down for a long time. They brought out the stretcher. They brought out the neck brace. They loaded him onto it. They carried him off. I was so concerned that I I sent a an email to somebody in TNA and I said is is Stevie okay and they alerted me that it was just a very well done injury angle and I was like thank god so then on this show AJ does a pile driver which looks botched but was obviously not terribly dangerous Stevie goes down the announcers freak out for a moment And then Taz is like, no, his fingers are moving, he's fine. No, his arms, he's moving his arms. They cut away. There was no stretcher. There was no stretcher. There was no EMTs. There was no neck brace. They cut away. They, in fact, they cut away to uh, Pope putting a miss in a casket. That was more important than Stevie. Yes. And I just sat there and I thought, what a complete fucking waste. Yeah. Why do you even bother going to all the trouble... Of of doing an injury angle, and then you edit the injury angle off the show. They they guys they changed their mind on Monday, and decided they needed him back on Tuesday, so they just erased the injury angle. Maybe they decided it was too important to show the Robbie E match. It's too important. It, it was very important to have Stevie on the next day when uh, whoever got fired got fired. I don't, I don't give a fuck, Raven or somebody. I don't know, but yes, it was. And then the way they chose to do it, it was the Styles Clash, where instead of landing on Stevie's belly. Stevie curled up his neck and came down on the back of his neck and shoulders. And AJ didn't land on his feet. He landed with all his weight on top of Stevie. I hope he's okay. I guess he's okay. I hope he's okay. This was an amazingly stupid thing to do. Nothing good could have happened here. Well, it was fine. It was it was what it was. Then we had Pope wheeling the casket to ringside. Abyss ran in and attacked him. And my question here, I'm all about... I'm all about trying to, you know, sustain my disbelief, as they say. But Eric Bischoff stole the company from Dixie Carter. 
He was just humiliated. He was beat up. He was forced to rap. He was locked in a casket. Why isn't he going to fire Abyss? Or, I'm sorry, Pope. Or Abyss. Why, why, why will Pope be employed next week? I don't know. You know, there was a time where, where Steve Austin was feuding with Vince McMahon. And and for a long time, it, it, it did strain credulity somewhat. But at the same time, they always tried to come up with some sort of excuse as to why Vince McMahon was not going to fire Steve Austin. You know what I mean? They always had some sort of explanation as to why it wasn't going to happen. Yeah, for a long time, it was simply because he was a champion. Here in TNA, it's just like, well, there, there was that period of, of Vince... Vince didn't want to fire him, but he wanted to hire a heel ref to steal the title. And I always hated that steel ref bullshit, but it's just so stupid. Why would Eric Bischoff not fire the Pope? I don't have any good reason. Now, Especially say, because they're doing another angle on the show where they want to fire the EV2 guys one by one. Yeah. Why not just fire the guys you want to fire? I don't know. Because this show is stupid. This show is stupid. So Bischoff... And you haven't even touched on what I thought was the most stupid part about all this. Well, hold on. Bischoff gave Pope a low blow, so Pope looked like an idiot. Old man beat him up. They put Pope in the box. They ran the box into the stage. Abyss started cutting this promo. And then we got the... the Something about this segment that was so great that I actually... I forgive them for all of the stupidity of it. And that was after they ran the casket into the stage and Abyss started cutting his promo... In the background, Eric Bischoff began delivering karate kicks to the casket. That is true. That was fucking hilarious. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I won't argue with the kicks, but this the spot where they put the box through the wall. Think about this, everyone. You, you've all, as you've seen wrestling for any length of time, you've seen caskets. It's a big, shiny metal box. Inside, it's there's some fabric. It's relatively padded. So you put... Pope goes in the box... The box goes through the wall, doesn't slow down, comes out none the worse for wear. How is this even supposed to have hurt him? Well, his feet. But it didn't slow down. (laughs) I don't know. And so, A, it is impossible to take seriously as any kind of injury angle. And B, they just did an injury angle in the prior match. Yeah. Keep in mind, everybody, this one... Well, they erased the one in the previous match. It wasn't really an injury angle. I suppose so. But keep in mind, everybody, this was better than SmackDown. Then we had Matt Morgan and in a three or it was a three on one match, Beer Money and Doug Williams against Matt Morgan. And a uh, couple of things. First off, if anybody from TNA is listening, your show is taped. So when you are recording it live and you cut to a shot of Ric Flair. And behind Ric Flair, there is a fan who is so obviously on their phone texting and paying absolutely no attention to the match going on inside the ring. You don't have to put that on television. You can edit that off the show. I just couldn't even believe this. This girl was like, she could not possibly have given a fuck less about where she was or what was going on in the ring. She was busy texting somebody about what they were going to do tomorrow or how she had been dragged here by her boyfriend and how stupid this shit was. And they just left this thing on TV. I could not even believe this. So they have a match. It's uh, not really all that great. And keep in mind, Beer Money and Doug Williams are both involved. Tell us something about Matt Morgan. So they do the match, and uh, Bischoff did commentary. Actually, Bischoff was great here. He said he'd had it. If Morgan didn't win, he said he would never get a shot at Jeff Hardy again. I don't know why he's so mad now, since he was so mad earlier, because Matt Morgan got screwed. So Morgan made a comeback. He hit a uh, double suplex on Beer Money. I was hoping he would set up and go, Beer Money, all by himself, but he didn't. Then the show ended. Yes. Time to go to the low-rated reaction, where Morgan punched Flair. Flair grabbed Beer Money, dragged him to the back. Williams ended up, uh, I wrote, getting double teamed, but it was actually just one-on-one, and he got pinned. And Eric screamed, fire that referee, and, uh, yeah. So, yeah, Matt. Oh, then Hardy attacked uh, Morgan and uh, laid laid waste to him, left him laying. Twist of hate. Yeah. I like to give this show a twist of hate every week. 
I don't know. I, I could not hate the main event. They, the crowd was cheering for Morgan more than they have maybe ever by the end. They did. But the fact that Beer Money ran away and left Doug Williams to die protected them. They so they did not lose three on one to Morgan. It was a, a one on one victory. And uh, it also made sense because they've been feuding with Williams. And here's the problem. Yeah. No one cares. Did you watch the pay per view? I did. Did you watch Jeff Hardy against Matt Morgan? It was very, a bad match. If you were a booker, you really would want to do that match again? Oh, no, of course not. Okay, that's what this main event was all about. Well, yes. Yeah. Setting up that match again. Well, I'm not judging what it's leading to. I'm judging what actually happened. There were many worse things on this show. Well, that's undoubtedly true. All right. That's hardly high praise. To the back! All right, let's, um, let's do impact. Why don't you... Uh, Get working on that. Back over to the Ric Flair coming out. He said he wanted to talk about Matt Morgan. He said Morgan had complained after the pay-per-view match where he said he was screwed by the referee's incompetence. What actually happened, everyone, is that the ref, in storyline, the referee made an honest mistake and Matt Morgan forgave him. But Flair said he was complaining. It's one of the things that really pisses me off about this show. And that is that... If you watch this show and you're stupid enough to actually pay attention, you're never rewarded. Yes. These people, these fucking people cannot keep their own storyline straight. Or, or more, more likely, there's just a, there's an issue with, with nobody telling anybody else what the fuck's going on ever, which actually happened on last week's show. When the announcers were talking about how Sabu was fired, and then Ric Flair came out and announced that Sabu was being fired. Yes. Nobody, nobody tells anybody else what the hell's going on, which was hilarious, fucking hilarious. On the Hulk Hogan deal last night, they had a a clip of a booking meeting backstage, and there's all of these people in a room. Which, first off, that's your number one problem. You don't need 25 people putting this this goddamn show together. You need one with a brain. So there's like 25 people sitting around, and Mike Tanay is reading the script of Impact. And and Hogan's there, and Bischoff's there, and Hogan has some sort of suggestion, and Bischoff says, of course, it's great to suggest and Hulk, and this and that. And it's just like astounding. So th- there's like a read-through of the script, and like nobody in that room stood up and said, you know... <laughs> This Matt, makes Morgan, no sense. Matt Morgan did not, in fact, say that he was pissed off to be screwed at the pay-per-view. Matt Morgan last week on this very show. In fact, in fact, you can't even say Matt Morgan last week on this very show. Matt Morgan yesterday at the previous tapings. The previous tapings. We taped a vignette where Matt Morgan, while Eric Bischoff was yelling at the referee walked in and said it was no big deal, everybody makes mistakes, he forgave the referee. So the next fucking day, they actually read through the script where Ric Flair comes out and talks about how Matt Morgan is all pissed off about being screwed. How could no one in the entire fucking room have stood up and said, you know, hold on, that doesn't make sense. Or maybe someone did and they just said, don't worry, no one's paying attention. I think there's a third possibility, which is that Ric Flair is given a script, he skims it one time and throws it out. That could also be. Because he, he got this promo here. First, I thought he said, I thought he announced that he himself would be the guest referee for the second Matt Morgan Jeff Hardy match. He did. Okay. Well, there you go. Then he called Matt Morgan out. He explained that for the past several months, Morgan had called him Nate, but he is no longer allowed to call him Nate because he's no longer friends. He said he would pay for dumbing fortune and becoming, quote, a kiss ass good guy. And he announced they were fighting the main event. And uh, later it was explained to me that if Morgan beat Flair, he would get his title shot and would get the name referee for the title shot. That was, in fact, what they talked about in this segment. Okay, then it's just me. Vinny. Okay, so... The point is, the gist of this segment, for those of you not paying attention like Vince, is that Flair came out, the heel, a small heel, mind you, and he said to the giant... To the big giant baby face, I am challenging you to a fair fight tonight. Yeah. He cut a promo talking about how he was a wrestling god, and when he was done, everyone cheered him and went woo, because, of course, he's a baby face. Sure. He does shit like that. Yes. So this was just, you know, Flair's great on the mic in the sense that he's, 
I don't even know what great even means anymore in wrestling. I mean, as far as, like, delivering lines and that sort of thing, he's, like, out of this world. But, Jesus Christ. I mean, Ric Flair is not this stupid. So, I don't know what happened here. But this was this was absurd. The idea is they were trying to get Matt Morgan over as a babyface and Flair over as a heel. But a complete moron would have written this segment if that were your goal. So, anyway, this was goofy. We had a bit backstage where the Gen Me guys were walking around. Tara slapped him on the ass. So, she wants to fuck them, apparently. Milf gimmick, that's what we need. Right. We had the following eight-person match. Before that, we had a deal where they randomly announced while running down the show that Raven was right. in a match tonight where yes. if he lost, he was fired. Yeah. Just absolutely out of nowhere they announced this. Mm-hmm. Was there an angle last week that I missed? Somehow I, I picked up on the, the uh, Matt Morgan Ric Flair thing, but I missed the fucking giant angle that is resulting in Raven having a Loser Leaves Town match tonight on this show. More on this later. Yeah. So here was the eight-person match. Generation Me, Robbie E., and Cookie versus Jay Lethal, The Machine Guns, and Velvet Sky. Now let me cut you off right there. Before you even get to talking about the match, let's examine this for one second. Last week, Cookie was involved in a match that was so fucking bad that they had to tape it twice. Uh Uh-huh. And the second match, the, quote, good one, was horrendous. So the very next fucking day, they decide, let's put Cookie in the ring again. Why would you do that? (laughs) Because that's what they had planned, and they can never change the plan. Why would you do that? The answer, obviously, is because... TNA does not learn from their mistakes. They make mistakes and then they repeat them because they are stupid. Right. So, yeah, they had this match. It was explained here that Chris Saban and Velvet Sky are, in fact, fucking. Which is true, by the way. I don't know about fucking. They may be waiting for marriage. But and they that, are that dating. term was not used. I am jumping to conclusions. They are dating. But, uh, yes, they are a couple. So... Yeah. They could be having relations, but that is, that is uh, frankly determined. If I'm going to be honest, it's their business. It's not mine. So they were having this match. It was the the six dudes were involved. It was fine. They were doing wacky exhibition spots. And then Cookie came in and Velvet speared her. And suddenly all eight people began to do things at the same time. And the ref is just standing there. Just standing there. There were dives out of the ring. There were double team spots. There were people going in and out. Eventually... The uh, Generation Me guys got a hold of Jersey Shore's hairspray. They sprayed Chris Saban in the eyes, and he was thus pinned. You know, I was thinking about something today on the Lance Storm show when he was talking about how Vince went on a rules kick, and he demanded one day that Jim Ross show up next week with the rules of wrestling so they could they could read them to everybody and determine what was allowed and what was not. And I was thinking about that as I watched this match. I never really thought about this before, but there are, like, no rules in TNA. Like, rules are just randomly enforced and not enforced. So really, there are no rules. I mean, when it's completely arbitrary, what's allowed and what is not, basically there's no rules. So, when you have a match like this, where there's like eight fucking people in the ring, and they're all running around all over the place, and they're all beating each other up, and the referee's just standing there like a fucking idiot, looking at all of this going on, it is lawlessness. So, in the middle of lawlessness, when a guy... Cheats? Who fucking cares? No one. It's like in the middle of a gunfight, someone pulls a knife. Right. Who fucking cares? They don't understand this. They're so stupid. They're so fucking stupid that they don't understand this. They have all these rule breaking in the match, and then a guy cheats, and they expect people to be angry. No, people don't care. Because a guy cheated in the middle of a bunch of fucking cheating. Hate this show. We then had Jeff Jarrett backstage with Gunner and Murphy. Before that, we had a segment in the oh, back. Oh, uh, was short, but yeah. The guns were so pissed off that, that, that cheating occurred during lawlessness that they challenged the Bucks to a, ma- a match on reaction. An empty arena match, which I was told I had to watch. I'll get into that here in a minute. We then had Jarrett backstage with Gunner and Murphy. He ordered them to watch out for Kurt Angle. He did not want them at ringside. He wanted them outside the building patrolling for the Mad Olympian. He did not use those words, unfortunately. 
He grabbed Jeremy Borash. He explained that he wanted him to call the action in the ring was about to happen. This segment went on for like an hour. Just Jarrett rambling on like a madman. He finally said that, that himself and Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan and the rest of the Immortals, he said, and this is a direct quote, they were going to make the company profitable. We're going to make it profitable once and for all, he screamed. Yes. Let me repeat that one more time. We're going to make it profitable once and for all. Mm -hmm. They revealed on their own television show that, at least in storyline, TNA has never made any money. Yeah. Or not not consistently, because he didn't say once and for all. But he also, by the way, apparently making a profit is evil, because it's the heel's goal. You know what also... And that was reinforced, by the way, in another segment later on the show. Making money is, in fact, an evil desire. Well, it can be argued. You know, the, the other thing that I, I hate about this was your, your typical TNA deal where Borash is back there, Jarrett just screams at him for hours on end, and Mike Tanay on commentary starts talking about how we're supposed to care about this because, you see, Jarrett and Borash have been friends for ten years. Really? Really. Let's think about, let's add up all the time that Jeff Jarrett has been an asshole heel in the history of, of TNA. Most of it. They were friends during all of that because they sure weren't on television. Why did they do that? I don't know. Why, why, are, why are backstage things that nobody knows a goddamn thing about, why are those always turning into storylines when in front of our own eyes we have seen something completely different? Well, they, they could have, I mean... They could have done a storyline wherein Chris Saban bumped into Velvet and started a relationship. No. We were just told they are dating. Sure. Well, I mean, that's at least... That one I don't care so much about because it's at least something that just occurred. Well, they're it, learning it, us that, hey, they went on a date two weeks ago, now they're fucking. Not only that, but we have not seen any point in the past eight years. We have not seen them opposing each other. No. They just, their paths never crossed. So it's believable. Have there been vignettes for the last ten years of, of Jeremy Borash and Jeff Jarrett on picnics? I don't think so. When Jeff Jarrett was hitting people with fucking guitars and, and being an asshole, you know, Jer- Jeremy Borash, the friendly babyface announcer, was, was palling around with him. Really? I'm unaware of that. So this was stupid. Six complete dorks in MMA gear came out. And Jarrett came out in his gloves and his fight shorts. And... uh I actually did not hate the segment. I'll tell you why. I did hate the very premise of it. <laughs> I didn't hate the segment itself, but I hated the very premise of it. Listen, if you want to put some MMA moves in your wrestling matches, like Brian Danielson does, or maybe Richards, great. But when on a pro wrestling show you say that so-and-so is an MMA fighter, that's idiotic because when we watch a pro wrestling show we're supposed to pretend or we want to pretend that what we're watching is real right isn't that the idea yes tell me if i'm missing anything here so if we're pretending that this is real then if pro wrestling is real what is the difference between pro wrestling and mixed martial arts uh pro wrestling has pins that would be it so, isn't pro wrestling itself a mixed martial art? It would be. I mean, you know, amateur wrestling is a martial art. Sure. Karate is a martial art. Pro wrestling, by the rules, has... You can do any, anything you can do in a UFC ring, you can do in a... In fact, you can do more. Yeah. So, what does that mean that an MMA fighter is in pro wrestling? Is it a guy that just refuses to pin men? <laughs> I guess... I don't know. You're Jared, already thinking too much about this. I'm not. Jared comes out... I'm not saying you're wrong. ...as an MMA fighter, and he says he's going to demonstrate a bunch of moves. Now, granted, when, when you read about these in the spoilers, it sounds stupid because he's referencing people from a long time ago, but I actually thought that Jared did this very well. He first said, I've been in thousands of fights, in bars, inside the ring, outside the ring. Let me show you some moves. So he calls over a dork... And he says, let me show you an arm bar. A Juji Gatami arm bar is yeah. how Jeremy Borash pronounced it. So it was not the worst arm bar I've ever seen. 
he applied a fine arm bar. So, then he said he was going to demonstrate a knee bar. I need to point out, by the way, he applied this arm bar. He told the youngster to tap, and it went too far. The youngster began to tap, and Jared, being a bully, kept it on for a long time, and the guy tapped out and didn't blow out his arm, but he, he was hurt. So, that's an important detail. So I forget what he called the knee bar. <laughs> the knee bar was referred to as a Japanese knee bar. A Japanese knee bar. Yes. So he applied the fucking worst knee bar I've ever seen. And he said that Frank Mir used this to tap out Brock Lesnar. I believe he just said Frank made Brock tap to this. Sure. Okay. Horrible knee bar. So then he showed an ankle lock. And he said a great man popularized this move. A former TNA champion. So all the fans chanted for Kurt, and then Jared said, No, I'm talking about Ken Shamrock. I don't know if anyone in the Impact Zone got this, and I don't care. That was actually funny. I like that one. Then he showed a rear naked choke, and he said, A great man perfected this move. So, of course, the fans chanted for Joe, and he said, No, I learned that one from Hoist Gracie. Now, granted, he could have said Randy Couture, for example, but they had to go back to the 90s. Regardless, I found that to be funny as well. So... Joe you, finally comes the out. The first three holes he applies, the men tap out, but Jared does not break the hole. They tap out for a long time. He finally lets go. So he applies a rear naked choke to this man. And the man... He managed to fuck it up, by the way, which is astounding. Considering it's just a sleeper hold. Mm. But uh, the the victim began to writhe in pain. Yeah. He wasn't being choked out. He was being, I guess, neck cranked. He, he was having his head squeezed. He was... And he was tapping out furiously. He was in great agony. I loved... Uh, the best part about the rear naked choke was... <laughs> Jared goes, this is how you apply it. He goes, the man runs at you, and you step to the side, and you put it on. And I thought, fuck. <laughs> that one you've been doing wrong. If only I'd known that that's the easiest way to put on a fucking rear naked choke. The guy runs at you, and you move out of the way, and then you apply it. So anyway, I desperately wanted to go to class after I saw this to try this strategy out. Guy, run at me. Exactly. Run at me, guy. So Joe comes out, and and he wants a fight. And Jeff said, I've got two students left. If you go through them, we'll have a submission match later. So Joe goes in there, and Jeff is shouting at the men to shoot on him. Those are exact words. Shoot on him, he yes. says. Presumably he meant like a shoot, like a takedown. Yeah, of uh, course. So Joe taps out the first guy with a Kimura, and then he used a uh, wacky Lucha headlock, which I'm sure has some sort of wacky name for the, uh, actually it was the Anaconda Vice. But anyway, so Borash says Joe must now face Jared in a submission match, and Jeff sent all the students after Joe and then bailed to the back, and Joe beat up one extra guy with a Uriah Faber-style muscle buster, and... Anyway, I actually thought this was pretty funny, and it was people were actually so mad when Jeff bailed and and Joe was there wanting him to fight that I actually think they added steam to a match with this segment, which astounds me. It happened once in a while. Astounds me. They also so anyway, two thumbs up for this segment for TNA. They were also as Jarrett was putting these holds on, the crowd was chanting "boring," Mm -hmm. which means one of two things: either. They really, really hate mixed martial arts and just want to see fake fighting, which they are Impact fans, so I have no trouble believing that. Yeah. In fact, that makes sense. Or they just were trying to give Jared heel heat. And now that I say it out loud, it's clear it's the former. They hate real stuff. So we had Stevie Richards unhurt with Brian Kendrick backstage. Chillin'. Gave Raven a pep talk about his match tonight with Jeff Hardy, where if Raven loses, he must leave TNA. That's what they said. So Morash comes out. And he starts reading off this very elaborate introduction. He talks about how this is the featured match of the evening, which had me scratching my head since there was an hour left. And he talked about Jeff, and he put him over, and talked about how I was the Antichrist of wrestling and the champion and a great man and this and that. And then he paused and calmly said, and now introducing his opponent, Raven. That was his entire entrance. Yes. That was actually really funny. That was awesome. There was a lot of good things on the show. So they actually gave Raven quite a bit, 
and he looked all right. And then Jeff pinned him with the senton, and that was the end of Raven's TNA career until he comes back. And they did this twice on this show. Listen, if Raven is leaving, why is he getting offense on your world champion? You know what I mean? Just beat the fucking guy. He's leaving. And, and Jeff's your champion. So that was kind of frustrating. But the EV2 guys came out, and by EV2 I mean Kendrick, Tommy Dreamer, and Stevie Richards. That's all that's left. Yeah. And then Hogan came out, and he said these guys deserve this after Dixie had the nerve to say that they were the equivalent of Hulk in the 80s. And he said, you are fired, quote the Hulkster, nevermore. Yes. He, yeah, he made fun of Raven's crybaby cry gimmick about, what about me, what about Raven? Well, what about you? He, Raven should actually be flattered that Hogan knows about his gimmick. Really. So, yeah, the, the uh, also, somewhere on the show, it may not have been this segment, but somewhere on here we were told there was a point where Raven angered management by storming into Eric Bischoff's and Hulk Hogan's office. It wasn't on this show. Don't recall seeing it last show. I don't know where that was. Maybe it'll be on the next show. <laughs> it'll be in the future. Then we had a segment that was just another one of those segments. This that is amazing. I just was astounded when I watched It really wasn't. I mean, I've, I've come to expect this bullshit. What happened was, Dreamer is in the ring. He calls out Rhino. Because Rhino, First of, course, of all, Tommy Dreamer decided that, you know what? While I'm out here in this ring, let me call Rhino out. Mm -hmm. This is the best possible time for this discussion. Because Rhino, of course, turned on them last week, and so Rhino comes out and he says, My contract expired. Nobody in EV2 seemed to care. The only person in the entire company who cared was Eric Bischoff. And he said Bischoff told him he could have a new contract if he turned on his friends. And he said, His first thought, he really said this, by the way, My first thought was to tell Eric to kiss my ass. But then I thought about it, and I realized... I had been here before Dreamer and RVD and the rest of EV2, and these folks showed up and stole my spotlight. So fuck you, he basically said. And Dreamer tried to put him over as being great, and uh, they uh, basically, uh, he keeps running up selling out, and they started talking about their fucking kids. I don't, I guess I do talk about my cats, but seriously, this was ridiculous. Well, I was... <laughs> They're talking about their kids, and it, it, it was it was such that the fans sarcastically started going, ah, poor buggers. And Dreamer said Raven and Sabu went down with a fight, whereas Rhino just quit. And Rhino, realizing that this is bullshit, because these two men who went down with a fight are now unemployed, and he at least is still supporting his family. Yes. He attacked Tommy Dreamer. RVD ran down. Rhino laid him out as well. Right. So to to encapsulate this segment, everybody, Rhino was forced to join a group he did not want to join in order to support his family. And then when two men attacked him, he beat them up on his own. And he is supposed to be a heel. Yes, he is sacrificing his own needs for his family. Taking on former champions and destroying them. Yeah. And we're supposed to boo him. We're supposed to say, no, fuck you, and Rhino. And by the way, there was also a line here, Rhino began his attack on Tommy by grabbing his bad wrist. Today then told us at the pay-per-view, and this is a quote, we saw the bone popping through the skin. No, yeah. we didn't. <laughs> that never happened. No, it did not. Abyss faced Shannon Moore in a casket match. Right. And again, again, they had a competitive match. Shannon Moore and Abyss had a competitive casket match. It gets better. They put over Shannon Strong and teased that he might win. Several times, in fact. Now, it would be one thing if both guys were in the middle of of meaningful feuds that were being pushed as top matches on pay-per-view. If Ink Inc., for example, was going to get a tag title shot at... Not even December. that. Yeah. If if it were Abyss versus Mr. Anderson, for example, fine. Have a back-and-forth battle. It's okay. It really is okay 
to beat a man up. He's not going to quit. Shannon Moore is not going to quit DNA if he gets squashed. Sometimes a man is expendable. In this situation, Shannon Moore was completely expendable. But no! He went toe-to-toe with the Monster Abyss. He nearly beat him in a casket match. And on top of that, when Abyss finally went to put him in the casket, he opened up the box, and the Pope was inside. The Pope jumped out. This was a disqualification. Yes. In a casket match. He broke the rules. So you see... They wanted to sell a casket match on pay-per-view by doing a casket match on TV for free with a fuck finish. Right. <laughs> Could I even <laughs> attempt to book a show this bad? You know, I didn't hate the show when it was over. The more we talk about it, the more we realize this was television. They wanted to sell a casket match for pay-per-view, and their fucking brilliant idea was... Let's sell this casket match by putting Abyss and Shannon Moore in a casket match. Have it end in a DQ. Mm-hmm. That'll get people to buy. And on top of things, the faces then double-teamed Abyss until he was sent packing. Yes. Two on one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't care anymore. We had a quick segment backstage where Angelina said that she was the leader of the locker room. By the way. Angelina was not on the makeup table this week. Amazing. Yes. She explains she was the leader of the rock locker room. She needed to know, to know everything about Mickey James because she was the new girl, and she wasn't just going to let her waltz in and name herself the number one contender. So then we had a match, Angelina Love versus Mickey James. It was good. They did shake hands like a dozen times before Angelina finally just pulled her down by the hair, and they had just fought after that. Even Taz was talking about, if you're going to fight, just fight. Mm-hmm. But they have a handshake. My kind of guy. Yeah. They they did eventually just had a normal match. Mickey won clean with her DDT. They said this made her the top contender, and then it ended. Mm-hmm. Hooray! Hooray. Although it is wacky that Mickey James is beating Angelina Love to Angelina Love is a setup for Madison Rain. It just seems yes. wrong. Well, of course it is. Oh well. That's that's how it is. So then it was stupid backstage. Let me talk about this. Go for it. Angelina I'm pretty sure it's a baby face. I actually have no idea. We need a script again, but Angelina's backstage, and she's throwing things around. She's breaking glass. She's generally being a very poor sport. She then sits down and starts crying. It's an odd reaction from a baby face. What a poor loser. So Winter walks up and says it was destiny that caused her to lose this match. She said everything was going as had been planned from even before the beginning of time. I'm very happy I didn't pay attention to what she said. If God... Let's just say hypothetically that God created the universe. Because that is a popular belief, I'm told. If God created the universe, and before he even began, he had plans for TNA... Uh, did you just turn atheist? That's just not right. <laughs> did you just, just alter your worldview? <laughs> it's just to explain away this idea. I need to call Brent. <laughs> Ask him about this possibility. That's just so wrong. You know what I mean? God had a plan for the universe and it involved impact. What? <laughs> no, no one, even the most, even the most hardcore conservative Christian, could have possibly believe that. That, uh, that, 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 that. that to me, suggests an imperfect God. So something's wrong with this theory that Winter had. Anyway, this was goofy. And she caressed. She yeah. began to caress Angelina. M- much as Tara wants to fuck Generation Me, Winter wants to fuck Angelina. That's mm-hmm. all anyone is doing in Impact is trying to get laid. You know, let me tell you this. I, I, I don't necessarily recommend this because, of course, you know, I don't like to, to encourage immoral behavior or anything like that, but... If if TNA just built up pay-per-views where the performers fucked, why not? They should probably do good business. It's worth a try. I don't know. I'm just thinking of ideas for them to make money. Porn is profitable. I've heard. It does well. Bob came out to explain why he beat up Devon, 
He said 15 years ago he created the best finisher ever, a move that no one had ever kicked out of before, which, by the way, is a lie. And he said this move won him, like, 23 world titles. It was the 3D, the Dudley Death Drop. He said he'd beaten Dreamer, Sabu, RVD, Taz, he Terry Funk, a million men. Undertaker, Steve Austin, he said, which I believe was bullshit, Hardy Boys, Edge and Christian, APA, Rock, Jarrett, Samoa Joe, even Kurt Angle. No one had ever kicked out, he said, until Chris Saban. And why? Because Devon was weak. Devon had always been weak. He said Devon was the co-star, the weak link. He was the Shawn Michaels. Devon was the Marty Jannetty. He could have said, for example, I am the James Storm and... and Devon is Chris Harris. Yeah. You know, something that has to do with the fucking company you're working for, you jackass. Then he did have an awesome line, which, if Vince Russo scripted this, everybody, I'll tell you right now, this was a fucking awesome line. He concluded by saying, Devon, you're just a sidekick. You are nothing more than a guy who got my tables. Yes. That fucking line, I don't give a fuck if they broke up, they, they broke up as a team, they do one feud on paper, and they get back together. This was all worth it for that line. That line was Awesome. So if Vince Russo came up with that line, everybody, I am on record saying Vince Russo came up with a fucking fantastic line. And that was it right there. This was a hell of a promo, actually. I'm going to hand back on it. You're nothing more than a guy who got my tables. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was on impact. Yeah. And there was no explanation, hey, by the way, for why I'll this... I'll say this, at least it was on impact and not fucking reaction. There, there was also no explanation for why this retired man was here to explain his actions. Or how he's going to come out of retirement. We had the main event of Ric Flair versus... All he said was that Team 3D was retiring. That's true. They're no longer a team. Mmm, I see. Yeah. All right. So we're not going to hear Bubba's rock music then? <laughs> Sadly, we're not going to see Bubba start a rock band. Pity. Ric Flair wrestled Matt Morgan. Again, let me just say, though, I am so pissed off these fucking people. I mean, seriously, it was so important that you get these guys on, on uh, Final Resolution or Turning Point or whatever the next pay-per-view is. Like, you couldn't have you couldn't have had them lose the match and then spent a month of TV doing vignettes of, of Devon at home with his kids and Bubba playing in his rock band. I mean, is that not like the most obvious thing in the world? And then in a month, you you have them do the speech, and then Bubba turns on him. I mean, why would you? Why wouldn't you just do that and get an extra month worth of programming? I don't know. That's just my idea. Do you think Bubba playing in a rock band would be fucking awesome TV? I would love to see Bubba Ray Dudley on stage singing rock music, playing drums, maybe a saxophone. Can't do anything right. Claire Andy Morgan. Is, how about a banjo? Rick Flair wrestled Matt Morgan. There was a ref bump, and he was apparently murdered. He was gone for like ten minutes. Thinks he's supposed to care about the performers, but this guy was down for five minutes, and no one went out there to check on yeah. him. So Matt Morgan is staring at the dead referee. Rick Flair comes up behind him and just kicks him in the balls like Sebastian Janikowski. <laughs> you, you've seen a million nut shots in wrestling. This was a perfect punt to the nards. Mm-hmm. So... It really didn't help much. They brawled outside the ring. Flair gigged. He was a complete mess. He took a giant choke slam. At which point, about a dozen men hit the ring. For and he a... took a giant choke slam. He was not messing around. Yeah. This... Well, Morgan was messing around. <laughs> yes. So, at this point, like a dozen men hit the ring for a very lukewarm reaction. It was all a fortune. Listen, let me say one thing here about this choke slam before we go on. As everyone is well aware, I've told this story before. I once had a girlfriend who was crazy. And our one-year anniversary, she... Where are you going with this? I'll tell you. My one-year anniversary, she said, listen. Or no, 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 I, I may have told the story wrong. There, there, was a, there was some sort of deal. I, I think what we were doing was we had celebrated every month. Because, of course, it was high school, for Christ's sake. And you know how relationships are in high school. A month is a big deal. So you celebrated month one. You celebrated month two. You celebrated month three. It may have been like month six or something like that where she said... I don't want to celebrate our monthly anniversaries anymore. It's getting ridiculous. We've been together all this time. You know, don't get me anything. And this was shortly after she had told me, cryptically, that it's time for me to revert back to my old ways. I'll never forget that line. That is the exact words that came out of her mouth. 
It is time for me to revert back to my old ways. I didn't know what that meant, but I soon found out. Regardless, shortly after she said that, she made that statement to me that we don't need to do anything for this anniversary. And I, having seen some signs, said, wait a second. You're telling me not to get you anything. But if I don't, you're going to kill me. She said, no, no, no. I'm serious this time. Don't, don't get me anything for this anniversary. If you do, I will kill you. So, like a fucking idiot, I didn't get anything. And I paid the price. The point is, all of you wrestlers out there that get a chance to work with Ric Flair, when Ric Flair says, lay it in hard, kid, or when he says, really get me up for that choke slam, don't do that. He's a 61-year-old man, for fuck's sake. Take care of the guy. Don't really hit him and don't really lift him up high for a choke slam. He doesn't really mean it when he says that. That's the point I'm getting at. I would like to point out that Brian... And always get your girl something for your her fucking anniversary. That's e- the other... Every rule. month. That's the other rule. Brian Alvarez watched Ric Flair wrestle Matt Morgan and thought of an ex-girlfriend. A crazy one at that. A crazy ex-girlfriend, so... I just thought about it right now. I wasn't thinking about it during okay. the match. So... Back to the Someone matcher. Someone saw the blood and blades. <laughs> Back. <laughs> She's alive, everyone. He didn't kill her. She tried to kill me. She tried to kill him. Rare form I'm in tonight. So Ric Flair and Matt Morgan had this brawl. Ric Flair was chokeslammed. He's a bloody mess in the ring. Fortune came out to make the save. And in the middle of all this chaos and bloodshed and havoc and, again, lawlessness, Doug Williams decided, you know what? This would be a good time for a face turn. And he started punching his teammates, left and right. He helped Morgan clear the ring. Morgan gave him a thumbs up. Flair turned around. Matt Morgan kicked him, and that actually was a very gentle kick. And he made the cover, and the ref returned just in time to count three. And by the way, everybody disappeared. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know where James Storm went or Robert Roode or Kaz. You know what's funny is last week, I knew, because I got all the taping results, I knew that Doug Williams was turning babyface and that he was going to to help Matt Morgan. So I knew this when I was watching the show last week, and it was a three-way with, I believe, Beer Money and Doug Williams against Matt Morgan, and Beer Money bailed, and Matt Morgan still beat the holy fuck out of Doug Williams and pinned him. And I remember sitting there going... I wonder how they're going to do this babyface turn, because he sure beat the fuck out of Doug Williams here. Why would Doug Williams possibly turn? And anyway, the, 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 the point is, I don't know why he turned. And in fact, the answer is, why not? Taz's exact words were something to the effect of, I don't really understand this. <laughs> I fucking love Taz. I love him. Oh, God. Now let's talk about uh, yeah. reaction here. What part do you want to talk about first? Well, let yeah. me save the Hogan thing for last. I just want to make mention very quickly. I'm not mad at anybody that told me to watch the Machine Guns match. I'm sure it was a really fun match and that sort of thing, but after two hours of impact, I just can't fucking watch this show. I tried to watch this match. I I, I did. We watched Impact, and I fast-forwarded to the Hogan promo, which I'm going to read here in a second, and then we, we started to watch that match, and I just I can't watch two and a half hours of Impact. It's impossible. This was a match where, first off, it was an empty arena match. Terrible okay? idea. There's a reason that fans attend wrestling events, and that's when you film them. Because this was a bunch of guys going, ah! My ribs! Fuck! There was a one, at least one fuck got through. Yeah. And they... they These are all real quotes, by the way. We're not exaggerating. They use the wacky camera where... You know, it zooms in and out real fast, and then it's 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 out of focus here for a second, and then they cut to another shot that's really dark because they didn't light it. And I'm sure that's really cool on, like, crime shows and dramas. It fucking sucks for pro wrestling. And I just, I could not get into this match, and I lost interest, and I gave up before the finish. There was no heat since there was no finish. And it was a ref, so I'm sitting there over thinking... I'm watching this. Why? I mean, uh, how are we going to have a finish with no ref? Is this going to be like backyard wrestling where each guy counts the pin for the other guy? Or Sadly, no. I don't even know what the finish was. What was it? The, was there a finish? There was a finish. Okay. Motor City Machine Guns are baby faces, right? 
That's my best guess? I believe so. Okay. So they had this fight. There was no heat. There was no comeback. It was all four minutes. There was no hot tag. It was just a bunch of guys doing moves. They actually did a, the Skull and Bones finisher through a table to the floor. Why? I have no idea. So if you really like watching guys do moves, great. So was that the end? They just incapacitated the man? No. Yeah, that's how they incapacitated, I think, one of them. The finish was the two machine guns took the last remaining Generation Me guy, they took him to the corner, and they beat him up, and they double teamed him, and they worked him over together, and they uh, were talking about how they, they, they brought Generation Me to TNA, and this is how you pay them back, and they said, are you done? Have you had enough? And the Generation Me guy defiantly spat in their faces and screamed, no! He showed baby face fire! So they beat him up more and left him laying, two-on-one. As the end? That's how it ended. Wow. Wow. That's not the dumbest thing on the show, though, everybody. No, the Rhino segment was still dumber. I'm talking about the Hogan deal. Oh, yes. That was, well, yes. yes. Let me let me read this here. Vinny, Vinny did all the work, but I'm going to read it. I just want to say that I'm sure Reaction is a great show. I'm sure that Reaction is, is probably better than Impact most weeks. I, I cannot sit through it after watching Impact. But hopefully this is not like an indication of, of what the show was like every week. Because Hulk Hogan did the fucking stupidest promo on this show. <laughs> so astounding that I'm going to read it here in its entirety. This is a direct transcription we went, what he said? We went back over this about a dozen times, going word for word. To make sure that, that we did not mistake what he said. It. Hulk Hogan said, We are so real, it's unbelievable. Because if you don't get over like I said, you're fired. If you don't draw a number, if you don't entertain, if you don't put asses in seats, if you don't put the coinage in the piggy bank, you're fired. No more games. No more kayfabe. It's a work. I've won 34 tag team belts. Who gives a damn how many fake belts you've won? If you don't draw money, you get fired around here. If you don't put asses in seats, you're gone. That's what he said. Who gives a damn how many fake belts you've won? No more kayfabe. It's a work. <laughs> I've won 34 tag team belts. Who gives a damn how many fake belts you've won? Astounding. Astounding. Hulk Hogan cut this promo. The cameraman filled the promo. The editor edited the promo. And the producers then put it on television. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, you know, notwithstanding all that, just this entire idea, if you don't draw money... Well, I realize the irony of that coming from someone in this company. If you don't put asses in the seats, you know what? There was one guy. There was one guy who made a difference. A marginal difference, mind you. On a scale of 1 to 10, he he took TNA from a 1 to a 3. That man was Jeff Hardy, who they turned heel. <laughs> yes. He is now at a 0. So, basically, that means every fucking person on this entire show needs to be fired. Yes! I've been saying that for years now. They need to be gone. Part of this Hulk Hogan uh, statement here. So anyway, reaction, everybody. No more kayfabe, guys. It's a work. Fake fucking belts. Who cares? Who cares? We need... Reaction needs to be guys going over their matches before and after. That happened last week. You didn't hear that? I did, uh, yes. I just, yes uh, there was, like, d was getting a promo in the backstage, or the background, you see RVD and Kaz. Yeah, going over their match. Something like that. Yeah. The quality control in this company is just so horrendous. There's no quality to be controlled. To the back! Well, I suppose we should talk about Impact. So we should talk about Impact here on this show, as opposed to my cats, for example. So, uh, get moving, Vinny. Show opened with Immortal having their Thanksgiving feast. Bischoff, Hulk, Abyss, Fortune, all the crew. Bischoff announced that Dixie Carter would be there, and this pissed off everyone else. So then uh, Matt Morgan came out of the ring for a promo. This was the delivery of everyone here is fine. The scripting for this promo was so bad. 
Morgan announced that he had beaten, quote, a bunch of merry midgets to win a title shot. Then he had said he had beat Flair for the right to name a special referee. said it was not the nervous referee's fault that he screwed up. It was his own fault for not beating Matt, uh, Jeff Hardy up so bad that he could never kick out. He said it would never be himself versus Hardy. It would always be himself versus Fortune. Therefore, he vowed to bring in a ref who was an ass kicker. And he guaranteed the people a new TNA champion they could be proud of. He guaranteed it? Yeah. You know, in the old days... <laughs> In the old days, a babyface never made a guarantee unless it was going to come true. Yes. A babyface never said, I guarantee I will win the title, unless he was going to win the title. So, not in TNA. I presume. I mean, either either way, they're completely stupid. Because if he makes a guarantee and, and doesn't win, then then uh, there's all your faith in the babyface. And if he actually does win, that's what? worse. That's much worse. What? 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 So Doug Williams interrupted here. He came out. He cut a promo on the rest of the guys who used to be, or, he, or are still are in Fortune. He used to be, used to be partners with. He said AJ Styles was a virgin. Frankie Kazarian wanted to be a model. James Storm would rather be drunk than smart. So than smart. And Robert Roode was actually a cheap bastard who bought a suit at a garage sale. So he's telling these bad jokes, and at every one of them. The crowd goes, oh, and Morgan himself is laughing. This is a classic heel promo. You know, it's funny. Every now and then, uh, every now and then we have David Lagana or somebody from ROH on the show, and inevitably somebody asks a question. Please ask why the production is so bad. Which, of course, you're not going to ask it in that manner. David Lagana, why is the fucking production so bad? I see. And I mean, the production really isn't that bad. I think their 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 concern, what what they're meaning to ask in a in a very rude way, is why is the crowd mic'd poorly, or why can't we hear the crowd very well? Which, when you watch ROH, suffice to say, it does not sound like there's twenty five thousand people in the building. But it's funny that ROH is getting that kind of criticism when it's the exact same thing in TNA. This Matt Morgan promo was as bad as the worst stuff you will see on ROH in terms of production. It sounded like there was absolutely nobody in that building, and it sounded like the people that were there were fucking around. You know what I mean? Yes. This was this is on national fucking Spike TV television, and it's like this. It's one thing when you're ROH on HDNet with a low budget. This is TNA, for Christ's sake. This was just... I was embarrassed watching this thing right here. So... William said that he he made the save last week. He did the right thing last week. He so more. And by the way, let me say something here. I have watched episodes of Impact where there's only a thousand people in the building, but it sounds like there's two thousand people in the building. So this is not an issue with production. This is not an issue with miking the crowd. This is an issue of your fucking guys aren't over, right? I mean, if it always sounded like this. Like, when you watch ROH on HDNet every week, you always get the same sound from the crowd. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, obviously, the, the issue there is is a production issue. In TNA, sometimes you will hear these people go and ape shit. But other times like this, they don't care at all. That's not a problem with production. That's a problem with you're pushing dudes that the people don't care about. Or, more appropriately, you have no idea how to get people over. More of the latter. But, uh, yes... So eventually, oh, uh, Williams told Morgan that he could trust him basically to be the special ref. Fortune interrupted. Flair started to talk, but he got too angry and could not continue, so Cass took over. He said when he was growing up, Thanksgiving meant live pro wrestling. So he challenged, this is what he called these men, the Queen of England and the Green Print. Yeah. That was supposed to be a burn. He challenged them to... It was supposed to be a burn. A burn. That's why it failed. He challenged them... tried to do a burn in 2010. Yes. He challenged them to an eight-man elimination tag team match. So basically, he wanted to do a Survivor Series match on Thanksgiving. He promised... He told them to get uh, two partners. It would be four and four. Then he said he would get rid of Williams and, quote, the two chodes Mm -hmm. you choose. And then it would be, and again I quote, Matty Matty Chicken Patty. Yeah. All these lines were from a real promo. Maddie, Maddie, Chicken Patty. That's what he called them. Maddie, Maddie, Chicken Patty, two shows, the green print, the shoot at a garage sale, and a bunch of merry midgets. All in one promo by three different men. I did like also the, the line about how AJ was a virgin, because 
You know, he in, has, in the world of TNA, he's fucked Karen Angle and probably some others that I'm forgetting. And he's he's been acknowledged as being a husband and a father. He has so it's awfully hard to be a virgin. The birthdays of his children tattooed in his flesh. <laughs> yeah, I suspect the man is not a virgin. You'd think. Maybe. I mean, I got no proof. I have Maybe not had sex with AJ Styles, for example. I don't know. Well, insert gay community joke here. So, we had a recap of the EV2 angle. Uh, then we went back to the Thanksgiving party. Flair was giving a pep talk. Kazarian said their meal was too carb-heavy. Ric Flair got iced again. This is like the third, third of these skits I realized Eric Young was the waiter. Mm-hmm. And then Bischoff got a phone call confirming that Dixie had landed in Orlando. Mm-hmm. Rhino versus Tommy Dreamer in what was billed as the last street fight. If that means they never do it again, cool. The last, oh, now hold on a second. Is this like the first match they've had? I believe so, yes. <laughs> and it, that's what they're it's starting it's with the last street fight. It's certainly, as opposed to the long string of street fights they've had previously. You know, I, I don't, I've never read Russo's books. I, I can't bring myself to do it. I mean, you know, if I were immortal, I'd consider it, but... I have a finite amount of time in my life, and and I really don't want to be on my deathbed one day and think, you know, I could have spent four hours with my cat, and instead I fucking read Vince Russo's book, you know, and and then I'd be pulling my own plug. But apparently, Derek Bergen has read this book. He was on the show today talking Christmas gifts, and he revealed the startling fact, maybe it's not startling, that Vince Russo, in his book, admitted that he hates reading. (laughs) <laughs> does he so, also hate going to church so <laughs> he preaches we've got a writer the head writer of a of a television show who hates reading not only that but he's the writer of a wrestling show who hates wrestling yeah everything he does he hates you've got a wrestling personally everything he does I hate a wrestling writer who hates wrestling and writing Yes. And reading. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, Jesus. It, it it makes a lot more sense when you when you realize that Vince Russo hates reading because you know maybe one day he was forced to read a book backwards or something and and he hated it but that's all he knows now I, I don't know but yeah so that makes that uh, that that makes me understand this whole starting out with the last street fight <laughs> starting out with the last street fight yeah so they had a 1998 which was ironic match. because yes it was the same street fight I saw in 1995 a billion times they did not wallop each other in the head with chairs thankfully but other than that it was everything you ever saw and then Dreamer hit a shot with a cookie sheet about the 100th time of the match and hit a schoolboy and pinned Rhino yeah a roll up in a, in the last street fight. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad it's the last one. You'll never have a chance to hit him with shit again to get the pin. So, uh, let's re- I want to state this clear because it's important for what comes next. Tommy Dreamer pinned Rhino clean. With a cradle. With a cradle. It's not even like he hit him with an object or gave him a pile driver off the apron. He rolled him up with a wrestling hold and pinned his shoulders for three seconds. Okay. He then decided to cut a promo on him. He's him being Dreamer cut a promo. He said Rhino went down with a fight with a fight, and he went down to entertain the people. He told them not to forget about their friendship and all he had done for the people. Talked about how he had wrestled RVD at the pay per view, and they and were. By the way, really, did he go down doing this for the people? Is that why they had this last street fight? It wasn't based I, on anger or, or vitriol between the two men. It was it was about entertaining the people. I, I could have sworn it was because Rhino beat up RVD and Tommy last week. Well, what do I know? Apparently so, nothing. the fans were so moved by the speech, they chanted, table, table, table. Yeah. Because there was a table still set up at the corner. So, of course, Rhino put Dreamer through the table, and they cheered. They did cheer. But and then, I will say this, they cheered, and then there, were, there was loud booing, and my, my, my immediate thought was, my God, they piped in booing. So, I actually have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever, because TNA caring enough to post-produce, to me, is a win. I don't think it's post-production. I think it's the fans. The fans know what they're supposed to do, but they're too dumb to do it at the right time. <laughs> so they missed their cue, and, and then, and then they, 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 their cheering was an actual, honest, legit, natural reaction. The booing was them hitting their spot. I see. They're hitting it too late. So RVD came down to make the save. And he challenged Rhino, who I will remind you was just pinned clean by Tommy Dreamer. 
Challenge Rhino to a hardcore first blood match for pay-per-view. See, that's the best part. Rhino, <laughs> Rhino didn't just lose a match. Rhino lost a street fight via a cradle and was immediately challenged to a pay-per-view hardcore match. Yeah. Name a single person that would want to buy that after seeing this match. Fuck no. Not a single one. Can't be done. Can't be done. So we had a backstage meeting. Morgan and Williams, they needed two partners. They tried to recruit Samoa Joe. So Joe was backstage having a nice, polite conversation with a production guy or something. And Morgan walks up, and I, I should have written down exactly what he said, but he patted the guy on the shoulder and basically told him to take a hike yeah. or come back later. Basically, he acted like a giant asshole. Mm-hmm. He then told Joe that they didn't like each other, but somebody has to take charge, making him look like even more of an asshole. Joe said he was smart enough to handle his own business and left. <laughs> but he said, I'll see you out there. But he said, I'll see you out there. I yeah, he also acted like an asshole. Yeah, well, frankly, he did. Everyone I, involved in this entire segment acted like an asshole. Yes, and there's more to come. I will just, well, I'll get to the, I have a speech, but I'll do it later. We then had what may have been the worst segment of the year. This was horrendous. Let me talk about this. Okay. So Flair meets with Angelina and Velvet and basically asks them to be whores for his guys tonight. Now, maybe I misread their reactions, but to me it looked like they were all for being <laughs> whores for a fortune. Sure. Which is quite the statement, seeing as how they acknowledged last week that, in fact, Velvet is dating Chris Saban. So I don't know what to make of that, but... So they're, they're uh, chit-chatting with Flair, naming a price perhaps, when up walks Mickey James, and female bitchiness ensued. Now, I could have sworn that Angelina and Velvet were baby faces, and that Mickey James was a baby face. So why all these baby faces were bitching at each other, I have like no idea. How many times on Raw have we seen like, Trouble in the ring involving girls, and like all of the raw babyface girls come out and kick ass. And they all come out together, and they're all smiling, and they, they kick ass, and then they all smile and hug. You know what I mean? Not on Impact. On Impact, every girl is a bitch, and every girl hates each other. And don't yell at me. I'm just telling you what happens. I'm even telling you the words that are used on the program. So they're yelling at each other, and then Tara shows up, and now they're all bitching at each other. And Tara and Mickey start getting into a fight. And as the fight occurs, in the background, Madison Rain shows up and begins palling around with Angelina and Velvet. Yes. Am I wrong about this? No. I looked at the background and said, hey, there's a third girl there. Hey, it's Madison Rain. Hey, the beautiful people have apparently reunited and nobody told me. They were completely fine with each other. So they're all hanging around chit-chatting, and Tara and Mickey are in a fight. And somewhere in here, it goes on forever, of course, like it always does. Somewhere in here, Sarita shows up, and then Winter, and Winter proceeds to, I have no other way to describe what she does except this. She growled like an animal and alerted them that uh, that uh, Angelina was now with her. And then Mickey and Tara uh, disappear, and now we've got Angelina, Velvet, and Madison all having a fight. And anyway, I have no idea what happened here. Just... I have no idea who is on whose side. I have no idea who's a fucking baby face. No. All I know is all these women act like bitches, and they hate each other there... all the fucking time. There was a point here where the beautiful people, all three of them, were watching Mickey and Tara fight, having a grand old time. And then Angelina apparently suddenly remembers she hates Madison. And so Angelina and Velvet ambush Madison and beat her up two on one. And again, like yourself, I could have sworn they were baby faces. And there's yes, no such thing as a baby face girl in TNA. I decided. And yes, apparently Winter has now taken corporal cor- physical form. Mm-hmm. I screwed that up. This was awful. She's physical form, but she's like a a weird woman. I guess. She she growled. But this is the she first like time. She looked at her. She went. Ah! Yes, but they all saw her. Yeah. So she's not just in Angelina's mirror now. Back to the Thanksgiving party. Bischoff was giving a speech. Jarrett was doing Hindu squats. Bischoff said he wanted to thank a very special person. They all thought he was going to say Dixie, and they were booing, and then turned to be Jeff Hardy. Hardy walked in with his belt. He said he was the sky, the water, the clouds, and the earth. 
And he got to a close-up of Robert Roode, who nodded knowingly. Mm-hmm. That was awesome. They showed clips of the empty arena match. You're missing the best part of this. All right. Jeff Hardy comes in, and he's all goofy, and he cuts his promo about how he's the sky, he's the earth, he's the moon, he's the sea, and then he pauses and he says, but I will eat! But I will eat. And then he sat down and started having Thanksgiving. <laughs> that was great. This, this segment ruled. They showed clips of the empty arena match between the guns and the uh, Generation Me from Reaction last week. Just clips, which is, in clip form, hey, it was great. Then they showed Chris Saban and Alex Shelley gloating about this victory, where they destroyed these men, cuffed their hands behind their back, kicked them in the mouth until they were unconscious. And to celebrate this victory, they were now going to have a TLC match at the pay-per-view. Saban actually said, chairs, ladders, tables, oh my! Which sounds like a legal letter in the making right there. It could be. But then they quickly corrected it and said it was a full mental mayhem that's, match. That's their name for TLC match, yes. So, yes, they, they beat them up so badly they are going to beat them up again. Madison Rain then stormed and by. Again, I realize, I don't know. I mean, that's going to be a good match. But yeah. what what compels someone to want to see that match after we just saw them beat the hell out of each other and the babyfaces be absolutely dominantly victorious Don't, in a free street fight? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have any idea. So, uh, yes, Madison Rain stormed by. She was going crazy looking for Sarita. Sarita. Then we had Matt Morgan and Douglas Williams trying to recruit Pope. They, first, they all agreed they didn't like each other again. Then, they, they told him they had already come, they, they had already gotten one guy, now they needed a fourth. So Pope was offended about being fourth. So he's a total prima donna. He found out the other guy was Joe, said he didn't trust Joe. They all went back and forth about this. You know, back in the day, if Sting or Dusty Rhodes or Hulk Hogan needed a partner, all the other baby faces would drop what they were doing to run to fight by this man's side. Because this man was noble, this man was good, it would be an honor to shed blood alongside this guy and fight for justice and, the, and right. Now, in TNA, being partners with Matt Morgan is shameful. Mm-hmm. It is a burden. It is to be avoided. No wonder no one gets over why are you surprised? You've got a guy that never watched any of that and never reads. What the fuck does he know about fighting but together in honor? He, he's he's, he's a, a backstabber in a backstabbing business. What the fuck would he know about, about teaming up and working together in honor? Yes. Nothing. Helping your friends. I feel very old and bitter right now. So then Madison Rain came to the ring. She brought a referee with her. She said that Sarita had been on, quote, the JV team, having matches on Explosion. Way to bury your own show. She caught up Sarita. They had a match. They were both wearing blue jeans with black tops. They both had brown hair. Fortunately, one of them is Sarita and one was Madison Rain. Therefore, one has talent and one does not. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to pull them apart. It turns out designer jeans are bad for wrestling matches. Actually, I'm, I'm completely confused as to which one has talent and which one does not. Sarita has more. Huh. They did not have a good match. Matt, I think Madison is is uh, has improved a lot, and Sarita has is uh, is we're trying to work American style, and she's not very good at it. She hit a cool move or two in this. I will say that. Hmm. But yes, it turns out designer jeans are bad for wrestling. They had trouble running the ropes or anything that actually required much athleticism. The uh, telegraph spots, and then in the end, Sarita won with what I guess was supposed to be a roll up. Yeah, the reason uh, they did this is because they just randomly decided, after fucking having Mickey James win a number one contenders match last week, now they're doing Mickey and Tara at the pay-per-view. And so they needed a new match for the champion. Swear to God. Why was this so important? I have no idea. But uh, they changed their mind between tapings or something like that. And by the way, they also said this was a huge upset, and I could have, maybe I'm wrong, actually, because I, I don't remember, but I thought Sarita was one half of the tag team women's champions. Oh, who cares? Is it really that big an upset that I'm she's the women's champion? you brought champion? that up. <laughs> who gives a fuck? We had a uh, Thanksgiving party. Jarrett announced he was drinking water only because he had to make weight. He said he had a DVD to show everyone, but he was going to show it after the commercial break. So we had a commercial break, and then all the guys at the party talked about what they were thankful for. Rude and Storm said they were thankful for beer and money. 
Eric Young started to say something, and they all shut him up. Kaz was thankful for fortune, thankful for his good looks, thankful that he had beaten RVD and Mr. Anderson. AJ was thankful for Ric Flair. I should have had Eric Young say, I'm thankful I can book my own dates now in the NBC. I'm thankful just to have a fucking job. Uh, AJ was thankful for Ric Flair. You ruined my joke, by the way. I'm sorry. Flair, honestly, I have no idea what he said he was thankful for. He was just wacky Ric Flair. He was thankful for the fountain of youth. I see. He did several crotch drops. Abyss was thankful for his stick and for caskets. Then Jarrett thanked Bischoff for not inviting Joe because, because if he did, there would be no food left. And everyone went, ah! <laughs> that was That's how heel promo should go. So then Jarrett showed his DVD. It was Jeff Jarrett going to a karate school to demonstrate submissions on five-year-olds. He tapped them out with ankles and arm bars. He had them try to tap him out. They failed. And then he left them <laughs> beaten in a pile and told them they needed to train harder. This was a masterpiece. No, it wasn't. Let me tell you something here. This actually, I'm pissed off now that I start to think about this. They have the unedited video. It's on the front page of our website. The unedited, unedited video is the best video I've ever seen. I see. I'm telling you that right now. For those of you that, that believe that I am biased, I'm telling you the best video I've ever seen is Jeff Jarrett tapping out little children. It's on the front page of our website right now. It's produced by TNA. reason I am so pissed off is, is upon thinking about this more, they could not air the unedited video, which was only slightly longer than this one here, because apparently there was so much stuff on this show that had to be on the fucking air <laughs> that they had to edit the video down. That infuriates me. No, that's fair. That absolutely infuriates me. Like... You know, the brawl with the fucking women had to go three minutes. They they, three. Couldn't, they couldn't trim that fucking thing down and air the entire four, Jeff Jarrett video. Five or six. You know, the I, 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 could, I could go through this deal here and I could talk about a a, a uh, I could talk about a minute in every fucking segment that was unnecessary. It probably ten second ten segments that didn't even need to air. Yet they had to edit two minutes out of the Jeff Jarrett video. Probably not even that. They probably edited out one minute of the video. But the rest of the show was just such a masterpiece that we had to cut out part of the Jeff Jarrett video. That pisses me off. Watch it on the front page of our website. It's fucking ten stars. And it's uh, on our website, and we're not going to edit the fucking thing. Well, I have not seen that video, so I can only judge by what was on the show. And all I can say is this is a video of which Bobby Heenan would be proud. I yes. will say this, though. Let me jump forward. Well, we'll talk about the match when we get to it. We had Jeff Jarrett versus Jesse Neal. And oh, we're at it right now. Let me talk about it. <laughs> All right. They've already fucked this up. You don't say. When I heard about the Jeff Jarrett deal and the spoilers, I was like, why are they referencing fucking Hoist Gracie and, and Ken Shamrock? Why aren't they, you know, this just sounds so stupid. But the segment where, where Jeff Jarrett tapped out men and he teased people thinking that he was going to attribute these holds to Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe, and instead he was attributing them to Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie. That segment was awesome. The segment here today where he tapped out the little children with various holds to show how tough he was, awesome. Even the finishes where the referee takes a bump, he hits the guy with a gimmick, and then he puts him in a hold, and the referee uh, wakes up and they're unconscious, awesome. That's how it's supposed to be done. So, of course, this week... They start to fuck the entire thing up. How? They put him in the ring with Jesse Neal in a submission-only match, and Jarrett actually starts applying MMA holds. Yeah. He takes Jesse down. He puts on an arm bar. Jesse Neal has to get the ropes. What? Yes. You've got to be fucking kidding me. The cowardly heel who has been boasting about his fake MMA knowledge, in fact, is an MMA, MMA expert. In three weeks. Yes. How can you fuck this up? I mean, now I'm astounded. I don't know. Stop fucking putting on holds, Jared. Jesus Christ, you've been in this business forever. They did the finish right, at least. Where the, the finish ref, was beautiful. The ref took a bump. Jared hit him with a guitar, put him in a choke. The ref woke up and, and did the the, the, uh, the the Why did you fucking edit that off the show? Why did you edit off the part of the show where Jeff Jared put the guy in a fucking arm bar on his own? Jesus. So anyway, that pissed me off. I will say I haven't had an explosion like that in a while. People, you don't want to know why? Because I get pissed off when because this is something that was good. They actually have something and they managed to fuck it up. Yes. 
people will remember the finish more than anything else. And the finish of this was Jeff Jarrett hit a guy with a guitar and then put a chokehold on an unconscious man. That's how it's supposed to be done. Yes. If they had just taken out the stupid part where he was actually applying shoot holes he successfully has and the skill. fucking baby face had to make the rope so as not to submit. I mean, come fucking on. Jesus. All right, what's next? Next is, and I quote, Brother Ray's holiday treat. <laughs> so Brother Ray came out. He basically repeated his promo from last week. Everything was Devon's fault. He was weak. He... He said, wrestling fans are not that bright. Which, in this spot on the show, with this person saying it, I was fine with that. Did the people cheer when he said that? Actually, no, they booed. Oh, wow. They figured it out. So, he had a special video package to show. The video was a long clip of Devon Dudley being beaten, followed by a long clip of, of uh, Bubba Ray Dudley beating men up. Mm-hmm. He, so, th- this, was, this was Ray's proof that he was the superior brother of the tag team. So he said he was embarrassed by this. He was. Uh, I gotta say one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just amazed at TNA sometimes. They did this, these videos, and the announcers actually went out of their way to say that Bubba Ray had bullied the production truck into making these videos. Now you care. <laughs> Speaking of now you care. Now you fucking care about instilling some fucking logic into the show? <laughs> God damn. Speaking of speaking of now you care now you care about pre production, the best part about this was the Devon or excuse me, the, the clip of Bubba Ray killing men was complete with piped in crowd noise. <laughs> he, on his own video he made sure the crowd was cheering him. Like, what that's, happens? Well, that is a detail the, that they paid attention to this one time. I just wish I could watch the production meeting where all of a sudden a light bulb goes on over somebody's head, and they're like, hmm, maybe we should explain why there's this video package of, of Bubba beating up men and Devon getting beaten up. And they're like, oh, man, Christ, never thought of that before. You know what I mean? The one time on the fucking show the light bulb went on for one guy? <sighs> so we had... Uh... One more Halloween uh, Thanksgiving party clip. Uh, Bischoff announced Dixie was in the building. They said to hide the liquor because she drinks a lot. And Hulk said sternly that when she showed up, he would not be responsible for his actions. I'm going to get into that in a minute. All right. So we had a main event. It was a Survivor Series match. Doug Williams, Samoa Joe, Pope, and Matt Morgan versus Kazarian, AJ Styles, and Beer Money. Classic TNA here. I mean... Close your eyes and book this match. All right, for a second, everybody. Now, yes. Everyone, just stop for a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be quiet for five seconds. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to, um, I want you to predict how TNA would book a Survivor Series babyface versus heels match. Ready? Five seconds. Go. All right. Here is what they fucking did. Obviously. They eliminated two heels first. Right. So the heels were not only at a disadvantage, but they were at a double disadvantage. They were literally outnumbered two to one. It was two to four. four. Yes. So then, how do the odds get evened up? Well, it's TNA, of course. So you see, what happened was, uh, somebody was selling. I forget who. It doesn't matter. But he crawls over to the corner, and Pope and Samoa Joe both make a blind tag at the same time. Of course, these men cannot possibly work together, so they start fighting, and they get eliminated. So, yes, the baby faces eliminated two men due to their own fucking incompetence. That leaves it to two to two. It uh, eventually comes down, believe it or fucking not, to Matt Morgan versus Beer Money. So oh, baby right. face, Actually, it was, it was Rude and AJ. Oh, Rude and AJ. AJ that's a detail, because you think... This answer is obvious. Matt Morgan is chancing for the title in the pay-per-view. He's going to beat these two men clean. Yeah. So, (laughs) if you thought that, you don't watch TNA. What happened was, Morgan made his comeback. He had Rude set up for the carbon footprint when Jeff Hardy ran in. Mm -hmm. And he laid Morgan out with, I believe, a nut shot. The referee broke. Right in front of the ref. Right in front of the ref. The referee chewed him out. Yeah. Didn't DQ him. No, just scolded him. Stop touching his testicles. And so Jeff Hardy laid out the referee with a twist of hate. And then I think it just ended. Yeah, there was no there finish. There was no finish to the no Survivor Series match. Yeah. They couldn't even disqualify the heels. They couldn't, yes. No Ma- one could Ma- lose. Matt Morgan fought to a draw. Yeah. 
So, by the way, this went off the air in the middle of the match, yes. so you had to watch Impact to see or the reaction to see the rest of this. I am just astounded. Not really. Uh, that's I'm being facetious. I'm astounded by the fact that they spend so much time on this show begging us to watch reaction every single week. When, and reaction never does a good rating anymore. It, it is constantly hovering around a point five five, a point five nine every single week. They just won't quit. They're begging us to watch this fucking show that nobody wants to watch. And I just sit there and I go, why don't you put this much effort in, like, promoting next week's impact? Or a pay-per-view. <laughs> oh, seriously now, Vinny, come on. Let's not be absurd. So they go and they do their end of the main event on, on Reaction, which, by the way, last week when uh, Ric Flair and Matt Morgan had their main event on Reaction, not only did it not get a good quarter, but people turned off when Reaction started in the middle of a Ric Flair-Matt Morgan match. Think about that, everybody. So they go to Reaction. We see the end of this match. And uh, then, of course, it's time for the Big Dixie thing. And I don't know if, like, this was taped on two different days or or what happened. But throughout the show, Bischoff kept saying that Dixie was going to show up, and Hogan was outraged. He was appalled. He was so mad that Dixie was going to show up. He said, I don't know what I'm going to be able to If she shows up, brother, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so then she shows up. They invite her into the room. And she's happy, and she's jolly, and she says, Happy Thanksgiving. And Bischoff and Hulk Hogan welcome her and say, Let's let bygones be bygones. Did I miss something? Did I miss a whole segment? Did I miss a whole show? What did I miss where, for the entire two-hour period, Hogan could not believe she was showing up, and he was so pissed off, and then she finally shows up, and he's all happy and jolly and welcoming her there and saying, let's let bygones be bygones. So then they had the fucking lamest meeting. Horribly acted. Nobody was any good. She is all happy and jolly, and then she gives him a paper, And she explains to them that it's an injunction against Hogan or something. Mentions she had a judge who was a family friend put it together. Hogan, the dastardly heel, says, have you seen how well things are going? And she says, yes. Which, I guess, I guess in storyline, Hogan and Eric have turned around TNA and she still wants to take it back. Yes. (laughs) Because the storyline is Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff have salvaged TNA. They've taken the mess Dixie Carter created and turned it into a money-making machine, and she's that pisses her off. Yeah, she still must take the company back. Because, you see, she does not care about making money in storyline. She just cares about being in charge. And Hogan and Eric, who are supposed to be these dastardly heels that have stolen the company from her, are, are arguing that we have done well, and, and you're trying to stop us. And after she walks off giving this, and they look at each other and they, they say... She bought off a judge. You, you, you're kidding me, Hulkster. No, she bought off the judge. If you mentioned it was a family friend. So, yeah, Dixie Carter has fucked the two guys that are turning her company around. That's the storyline. Mm-hmm. That is the storyline. And they did this, mind you. This is not just a... Uh, you know, this is not just a little uh, a goofy, like, you know, everyone's at Thanksgiving talking about what they're thankful about. No, this is a pivotal, this is a pivotal turning point angle in this storyline. And they did it on reaction, a show no one watches, following Impact on Thanksgiving Thursday. Yes, Ryan just threw something. I don't know. <laughs> Finny. I don't know what to tell you. Finny. The, they have, Dixie has just turned the corner in this storyline. She has gotten the heat. She has just gotten the heat on the heel. She's starting her comeback. <laughs> She's starting her fucking comeback. Nobody knows this. And they showed this on reaction. I know, I was following there. Following impact on Thanksgiving Thursday. Yes. I don't even know what to say. The the only thing I have to add to this is it's mostly a recap, but Dixie Carter, even though Hulk and Eric are now making money with the company, she wants her money her company back because she cares not about money but only about having power and satisfying her own ego. So she has resorted to underhanded legal means to satisfy her own ego. And I say this for the four hundredth time, she's supposed to be the babyface. Yeah. 
Keep in mind, keep in mind, the big heel heat was was when the baby faces stole the company from her supposedly. So now she has stolen it back. After, admittedly, they have helped turn it around. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why anybody would like this show. It is an awful show. It is a terrible, terrible program. 